Welcome everybody to tonight's show. Uh, tonight is the Tavistock special and we have Ben Emmeline Jones on to explain his story. And for anyone that doesn't know who the Tavistock are, then they call themselves the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. And um, let me just read a couple of things from Wikipedia. The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations is a British charity concerned with group behaviour and organisational behaviour. It was launched in 1946, which is just after World War II, when it was separated from the Tavistock Clinic. So basically, these are people that deal with group behaviour and social engineering, basically, and they are funded by the Roth... Is it the Rothschild Foundation? Uh, it says also on um, Wikipedia who funds them, who's involved... You've got the likes of um, Sigmund Freud and Relations of Freud all involved with it, like Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays wrote the book Propaganda. Um, these are the people that have been manipulating the world time and time again. And I'll let Ben introduce himself and his own personal involvement with the Tavistock. Hi, Ben. You there? Hello, Dom. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's um, it's a subject that I think everyone needs to know about. I mean, I've, um, I mean, you was mentioning some of the people who've been involved. I mean, I just, Dr. John Coleman is an interesting guy to look at because he was studying this long before the internet was invented. It's really interesting stuff on there. Um, but you want me to tell you about my personal, how I, I was involved in this personally? Well, yeah, explain how uh, you found out about the Tavistock Institute and how you got involved in this dark realm of it, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. Right, well, um, if you want if it, when when my involvement actually began, goes back to before I became kind of conspiratorially aware, it actually goes back to my childhood. Um, what happened was um, I met an old lady. Well, there's an old lady who became involved with my family called Isabel. What happened was, when I was about this, this began when I was about maybe 13 or 14 years old. Um, I just come out from my family, just sort of emerged from a period in which there was another man involved in our life, which who was very abusive towards me as a child. But that's that's a long story. That's another story in itself. And well, what happened was now you'll have to excuse me if I'm a bit sort of um, incoherent. What what it is? This is still quite painful for me to talk about. I hope you understand. You know, yeah. I, I still find this quite sort of um, heartrending, in, in, if you know what I mean. Do you, do you understand? It's kind of damaging to the soul. Yeah, it's, it's it's a long time ago, but still, I still find it painful to talk about. But bear with me. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you everything that happened. Um, my my mother, my mother, like was um, well. I, I don't want to sound like a snob. I'm not a snob, you know. But my my mum was a cinema. My mum was a cinema usherette. You know, she was no one sort of like special in the the way the conformist mainstream society calls special. You know, um, I mean, I know there's no such thing as an ordinary person, but I mean, as they would call her, an ordinary person. Um, my mum, my mum was a cinema usherette, and she decided, as an adult. To, to get an education, which you, you could do in those days an awful lot easier than you can now. You didn't have to get gr you know loans and things like that. You could get grants. So my mum went to university as an adult, and she studied psychology, and she studied at Brooks University in Oxford. And uh, then she went, to the, she went to a training college in rugby, which is um, where she, she learned how to, she trained as a counsellor, and she actually became a relationship counsellor. And... At some point, I mean, it's a long time ago, and like I said, I was about 13 or 14 at the time. She um, she came across an, a lady, a lady, this elderly lady called Isabel, who um, she brought home with her, basically. Um, I don't know how they met. I mean, she may, Isabel may have been some kind of tutor on the course. Um, this this was an elderly Scottish lady, and it seems like every every time thereafter. She was there all the time. I mean, she was in the house all the time. It felt like she was she was visiting every day. Do you know what I mean? She was there, you know, in in the evenings, at the weekends. She'd be coming around the house, sitting there just talking to my mum, talking yeah. to my dad. Um, and she she was somebody who, who my mum became kind of um, fixated on. Do you know what I mean? She became obsessed with her. 
Okay, yeah. She would always talk about her, and she would. They spent hours together, and my mum adored her. It became almost like a kind of surrogate mother for my mum. But so, she run it by me again. Who was this lady that came into your life? Her name was Isabel, and it was only years and years later I found out who she really was. Okay. Um, this was years and years later. You know, she, her, her actual full name is Isabel Menzies Lies. And anyone who has studied the history of psychological warfare will know that name. It's an infamous name. She is one of the founders of the Tavistock Clinic, which later on became the Tavistock Institute. She worked alongside people like John Rawlings Reese and Wilfred Bion okay, in creating yeah. this psychological warfare institution. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that at the time. I just knew her as Isabel. She was this elderly lady who was always around our house all the time. But she was, she was not physically abusive like this man was I knew when I was younger. She was very emotionally abusive. She okay. was very, very domineering. She treated me. She was she, funny enough. She was all right with my brother. She didn't mind my brother, but she, she really, really was very, very cruel to me. Emotionally cruel to me. Mm-hmm. And for for a young child, you know, for someone of a 13, 14, 14, 13, fourteen, fifteen year old, you know, nowadays I, <laughs> now as I, I, you know, she, no one could do that to me now. I tell them to get stuffed. Yeah. But I mean, I was just a kid and. She, I, she sort of had a kind of hold on me. You know? She had a hold on us all, and and she, she would treat me as a servant. I would have to sort of like get her cups of tea and coffee, and she'd sort of shout at me like I was a servant. Yeah. And the, the worst, the worst thing is, and this is really hurtful to talk about, but she turned my mother against me. When when my mum was w- with her, she, my mum was cruel to me as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, but when she wasn't hmm. there, like your mother would treat different. She'd be, she, yeah. I mean, she'd be much nicer when Isabel wasn't there. But I mean, I think, I think Isabel did change my mum even when she wasn't there. Right. She, 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 when, when Isabel was there, my mum was absolutely awful. My mum would sort of like joint, would like tag along with her in her, in Isabel's abuse of me, her emotional abuse of me. So, um, is, is your mother still about or? <laughs> No, my mum died in 2006. She died about a year before Isabel. So how long was Isabel in, in your life? Was she, or in your mother's life, rather? She was there, I think, sort of when I was, I left home, you see, when I was, um, when I was 19, I left home and I, I sort of lost touch. I came back, you know, I, I got back in touch with my family a few years later and um, Isabel was still there. Uh, but, you know, basically... I, I was, I was. It wasn't quite as bad because I wasn't living there. Do you know what I mean? Do Do you think she was um, manipulative towards you and your your family because that's the way she is within that sort of institute as such? Um, you'd have to be evil minded to be part of the Tavistock um, Clinic or the well, not not. not I'm not saying everyone that's part of the Tavistock Clinic or the Tavistock Institute are evil, but when you're having a look at the people that are running it. Um, they have socially engineered and manipulated most of the situations in the world from soap operas to pop stars to everything from the Beatles, Adele, um, what's her name, Amy Winehouse, yeah. the, the Brit School, they're, they're well involved with them. And um, they just come in, manipulate situations and then punt it out there. And go on, carry on, you're about to say something? Yeah. It's, it's it's hard to know what her her motive was for doing this to my family. It's it's very very hard to know why you know she, where she got involved and with my mother or anything. I mean, unfortunately, my mum's dead. She's dead. You know, it's I can't really say for sure. But I mean, what you said about the Tavistock Institute is absolutely correct. They they are involved everywhere. I mean, Isabel's Isabel's primarily involved with the NHS. That was her primary job. She yeah. she worked with the National Health Service. All all kinds of organisations employ the Tavistock Institute, yeah. and it's 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 very very hard to know exactly what they are like. Because you go to their website, I mean, if they they have a um, they have a mission statement, right? It says um, the institute is engaged with evaluation and action research, organisational development and change consultancy, executive coaching and professional development in all in all in service of supporting sustainable change and ongoing learning. Our staff work creatively with people involved in innovative activities, working across boundaries in difficult situations, combining research, analytical skills, practical help, devising solutions through the implementation. What does that mean? There's a lot of twisty it's, words there. It's gobbledygook. It means it is completely meaningless. It's it's impossible. It's impossible to know exactly what 
it's what the organization is about from reading that. It is extremely twisty. It's extremely misleading. It seems to be words that are designed to launder some kind of ulterior motive. And as what we've seen, I mean, we, we ourselves have seen that these people get everywhere. They, they're behind. They are, they are engineering our society, as Dr. John Coleman rightly points out. Yeah. They're behind political, a lot of, a lot of what you call um, the Orwellian language, you know, like phrases like collateral damage and things like that. Political Transition f- towns. Yeah, all, yeah, well, that's another example. Yes. These kind of little buzzwords that come out. And the latest thing is when it comes, you know, is, um, was it, it was, it's called enhanced interrogation. Have you heard that one? No, no. It's, it's, it's what they call, it's what the Americans call war boarding sleep deprivation torture basically they okay. call it enhanced interrogation now that is a absolute prime example of the kind of orwellian euphemisms that have been coming out of governments and other organizations these days and it's organizations like the tavistock institute at the behind it because they have subsidiaries all over the world they have a branch in australia they have um, branches in the united states there's other organ- people who and organisations that are involved in this, as you said, it all traces back to the uh, the Freud family, Edward Albanese, Anna Freud, um, who, who were behind psychoanalysis. Carl Jung. Yeah, or, or Carl, Jung actually he broke away from them quite a lot. He he became kind of quite of independent quite early in his career, you know. But the Bernays certainly, Anna Freud certainly, and all that lot. They were definitely they were right in there. And I mean, and I, I'm shocked hmm. actually because you've got Bernays, who's one of the biggest manipulators of them all in the Tavistock and on the list of people that they name on the Wikipedia site you've got everyone from Freud, uh, Young, Klein, Lang, R.D. Lang and all mm. these names Bernays isn't there which is quite interesting indeed so that is very unusual yeah, yeah. I mean so, R.D. Lang was the man who decided that families were evil <laughs> and that fa- your families were damaging now we've heard all we, we know very well about how there's an agenda to like the state replace the family in upbringing in bringing up children yeah you know so we can have communal raising of children this is there's more and more children being taken into care from their families on trumped up charges this almost happened to my daughter a few years ago you know this is it's happening everywhere what, what why what happened with that then well my my own daughter my my, uh, my own daughter was take was almost got a care order what happened was um my daughter's now 18 years old she's she's almost she's a student a drama student at college now so uh, i'm not worried about her now i mean she was 10 years old when all this kicked off and i'm very glad she wasn't any younger social workers got involved with her and s- said that basically she was living with her mother i just split up from her mother and they said that um she was not capable of bringing up a child she was mentally incompetent has she got is she mentally incompetent or was there I, any... I don't think no she, she's not diagnosed with any condition at all and neither and the thing is though they then they then said that i was as well they they sent us they sent this psychologist to analyze me this is it's this is it's actually chilling to the bone but they they sent a psychologist to analyze me um in 2005 and this was a lady from um, I looked. I managed to look into a suitcase where you know when her back was turned, and she had a letter in there. And the heading it was the Harley Street was on the heading of the le- on the header of the letter. And I thought to myself, this is the council. So this is social services, Oxfordshire County Council's, you know, uh, child uh, protection department, right? They're employing someone from Harley Street. It must have cost them a fortune. So why were they doing this? Was this because you was doing something at the time that was agitating people like the Tavistock? Well, I, it's hard to know, you know, because, I mean, I didn't start Hapanwo until the following year. Yeah. But, I mean, I was active on the forums and things like that. And also, it's, you know, there was this incident. This, to be honest, this happened the following year. But I was, uh, my, my, daughter's, my daughter's school tried to take her fingerprints from her. This has happened to a lot of children in a lot of schools. Um, they tried to take the fingerprints from all the children in the school, and they didn't tell anyone. They didn't tell the parents. And no, I, when no. I got wind of it, I kicked up. Well, I wrote. I actually told them. <clears throat> I phoned them up and I said, "What's going on?" Because Lu- Louisa, my daughter, had told me she'd come in from school and told me that they were going to take her fingerprints. For, and I phoned the headmistress, and she says, "I don't know anything about this." And I thought, "This is odd, <laughs> it's odd that she doesn't know anything about it." She says, "I'll, I'll get back to you, Mister Remlin Jones. I'll call you back, right?" Well, she never called me back ever. So what I did was I, I phoned back again. I kept trying to speak to the headmistress, and she wouldn't take my calls. Eventually, the librarian called me and um, said, 
don't worry, Mr. Emily Jones, it's, it's only a, a limited database that will only be used in the library and nowhere else. And they're not going to take the whole fingerprint of the child. They're just going to take one small segment. You know, and I said, well, look, with all due respect, lady, I says, that's not the point. The point is, firstly, the database is being created. And as for Big Brother, when it comes to Big Brother databases, you've got to deal with capabilities, not professed intents, because the authorities bringing in these databases are malevolent. And then secondly, it was actually so, it was so socially and psychologically conditioning the youngest members of our society to accept database as normal, the database state, constant identity checks as normal. I mean, we, we oldies and goldies, you know, we remember what it used to be like. Do, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like Winston Smith in the book, in the book 1984, uh, Winston Smith, he's, um, he's a sort of like middle-aged man and he's living in this big brother state, but he remembers what life was like when he was a kid. He remembers nursery rhymes. He remembers things like that, which yeah. are now banned. And, um, the thing is that the young, the, it's the little kids who are, who are getting all this programming from the, from the day they're born. And I mean, yeah. in that book, they say it's the children who are the, <clears throat> who are the most zealous of the sort of big brother party, you know, the Ing Sock party. And this is what I said. Anyway, what happened was the, the headmistress still didn't return my call. So what I did was I wrote to her and I took the letter in by hand. So I knew it arrived. And I told her that she, I'm, I'm withholding permission for anyone to take any biometric data from my daughter. I said, if any member of staff tries to do that, I've instructed her to refuse and refer that staff member to me. So um, when was that? that? This was before they, they came and started harassing you? Oh, uh, no, actually it was after. It was just after. Oh, okay. Okay. But I was sort of, it's possible there was a connection. It's possible there's a connection because I was getting quite vocal on the forums. You know, before, this is before I set up a Panwo, my blog and other websites. Yeah. Because you know. like, I, I got refreshed to your information um, after Occupy because I've seen bits and bobs of yours online a few years ago. And then after Occupy, and I found that, well, somebody sent me the information that the Tavistock Institute were involved, and mm. that that was the. I just didn't know it was going to be that much obvious information, and they hide everything in plain sight. Um, mm. Occupy were posting information that they're doing social dreaming events from the Tavistock Institute, and it's like you are inviting these guys in to mind control the protesters. My question is why, mm. and all they could say is we've got to get Dom out of the Occupy movement, and it's oh, yeah. like. And when when you look at it, you've got um, the very last Occupy in London, um, the, one of the main camps, Finsbury Square. It's literally a two-minute walk to uh, Tabernacle Street, which oh, is right. mm-hmm. where you'll find the headquarters of the Tavistock Institute. And when you think about these guys that manipulate everyone, their, their offices are so... Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't guess like you look at the MI6 building it's a huge glitzy building with loads and cameras on and everything but mm-hmm. these lot they've got like this this building tucked away of a dark street with hardly any windows above um, below well around eye level and it's just like really suspicious yeah it's it's an odd thing I mean I remember your own films from the Tavistock uh, from the um, Occupy movement and how, you know, how, how very sort of naive and sort of dismissive these people were of the danger they were in. It's really uh, quite sad that they didn't. I mean, I mean, what happened after that when they, when that camp went away? It didn't surprise me. Well, they're still at it. It didn't surprise me at all. They're, they're still at it. And um, I, I'm, I'm not going to give up. If they're going to try and... Well, what they're doing at the moment in London is they're doing some action on in Battersea on a on a kid's playground trying to save that and trying to call loads of people down to get a big protest going. But the only people that are there are the the manipulators that are running it anyway, which Mm. runs of people like Saskia Kent, who is Common Purpose graduate. Um, Twice she's done the Matrix course, and she's well involved with the Occupy movement. And then you you find people like Manny Cher, who is like right at the top of the Tavistock Institute. Mm. I had a word with him around the time of Occupy, and they said they were involved from week one and involved worldwide. So right. who who invited the Tavistock Institute into this leaderless movement to do whatever they needed to do? Yeah, I mean, it's some. Um, it was only after, actually, the because I went to the tent city and I had a walk around there and I talked to some people. And I thought, this is really great. This looks really, this looks really great what these people are doing. And um, then... You know, if after a while it sort of like sort of fizzled out, and it was only then I saw your videos, and I thought, oh dear, it's, it's they they've just completely infiltrated it, and controlled it. See, I, I, I'm on the other opinion. I don't think Occupy was infiltrated. I think it was orchestrated. And I, I, was, yeah. I was saying this for months before the start. I didn't want to go anywhere near it. 
Mm. I've, I've, met, I've spoken to people. I've made videos about this. So I've met people who think that as well. And it's you know what? It's possible. You're right. It's it, I can't. It can't be ruled out that this whole thing was just set up from the day go to from the from the beginning, just to diffuse some kind of tension that was building up. It's a leaderless movement, but somebody had to have um, set this format out of where you've got GAs, you've got a finance team, you've got a press team, and it was the same format in every single Occupy. And every single Occupy, people came in and put themselves in self-appointed positions of leadership, like Saskia. Yeah. So these guys come in and control the movement from the start. People did know about this, and then the people that are following it, following the movement, will follow the, the vocal people who have been sent there, who are there and getting paid by certain companies. Yeah, that's it's it's totally it really is it's quite um it's it's sad in a way but I mean I think hopefully it's an experience we'll learn from you know it's a, it's a it's something that we'll be maybe we'll be more wary of it next time and make sure that we don't fall into these traps because these people are expert manipulators of the human mind I mean I've on on an organisation on a personal level I mean I've I've found out you know that um, for whatever reason this uh, this woman decided to attack my family yeah. I mean, I don't know why she did that. It's just maybe because she could. Maybe it's a kind of game they're playing. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. So, what, was it just um, she was coming in and being like manipulative, or was she just, um, or was she going further than that? In terms of what physical abuse? Um, yeah. Well, like basically, she'd come in, she'd be evil to you, um, get your mother to be nasty to you because your mother's befriended her and she's looked mm. up to her. Um, I can see how that relationship sort of formed, but did, did it go any further, like um, getting other people in or even physical? Um, she was never physically abusive, um, which was, I mean, there was a man, in, like I said, there was a man in my life before who was physically abusive to me. Um, this this lady was not, uh, but she was very, she was, me she was mentally very cruel and um, she was she was using what I would now call, you know, she she must have been using someone with her experience who, who's who been doing this basically since the 1940s at least would know how to deal, how to manipulate people. And she must have been using some, some of these tactics on me and my family. I don't know what. It's a long time ago and I can't say for sure, but it's I, all I, I remember her aggression. I remember her, her rudeness, yeah. her, 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 you know, she's very the way she was bad tempered with me and would speak very harshly towards me very prickly um and my mum would do the same when whenever isabel was in the house well they are the leading psychotherapists and um <laughs> mind benders it's... yeah it's... what happened was after my mum qualified she trained as a, she worked as a counselor okay. she actually got a job as a, as a relationship counselor and Is isabel was was sort of like um supervising her most most of the time i think um if not informally i don't think isabel was never my mum's boss but my she was always there she was always in my mum's life both professionally and personally and, and this was while she was working for tavistock my, yeah um she actually I, th I think she actually she, she she never stopped working for tavistock i think she became sort of like um semi freelance in her later life yeah but she was never she was always sort of like involved. She never completely broke contact with her. And some of them turned up at her funeral. Some some of the Tavistock people turned up at her funeral. I remember. I didn't go to the funeral, but um, I heard that they did. Well, I, I, I'll tell you what. The only people that I've met from Tavistock are people at Occupy. And that mm -hmm. they basically turned up. And um, I can remember one time, and I didn't know at the time, that the Tavistock Institute were involved but I was saying silly things because I was noticing it. It was, it was obvious to me. Um, mm. I said to one young lad who is now in prison for punching a policeman, and he was a lovely, polite, quiet lad, but he went on four social dreaming events created by the Tavistock Institute within oh. Occupy. And then like, he, he just changed. He was wearing all dark clothes, and he turned into a hardcore uh, protester, climbing up um, things, getting arrested and doing dark things. And it was like I was saying to him, are you enjoying your climate camp brainwashing? Not knowing yeah. that it was Tavistock doing it. And then yeah. one day I was at Finsbury Square and uh, some specky young lad has said to me, um, would you like to tell me about your dreams? And I was like, 
well, yeah, I dreamed that people wouldn't come into this place and try and mind bend people and just <laughs> walked away. Good and answer. Then I, then I look back at it and think, if I knew it was the Tavistock, I would have played a completely different ballpark. I would have yeah. sat them down, had a chat, got my camera out, and started asking them questions because mm. these are just human beings as well, just there. And I, I don't know. I don't know if they're, they're good people or not. But I had an experience down there where I was talking to Manny Sher and then I went back to Occupy and um, Danny Shine turned up with his megaphone and um, he was megaphoning outside Finsbury Square talking about um, social engineering. So I've gone mm. up to Danny and I said, um, well, Danny, it's quite funny that you're talking about social engineering and everything because we've just been knocking on the Tavistock Institute's headquarters. And he said... Oh, really? And I said, yeah, Manny Cher come down, and he's right at the top. And he said, oh, I know Manny Cher. I go around his house for dinner. I know his family. And I was like, oh, bit gobsmacked that I didn't even carry on the conversation. I was like, okay, so like, I know you've got um, big Jewish connections in your life, Danny, but I didn't know like you, you actually go around Manny Cher's house or, or you've had dinner with him. That was just yeah. a bit out there for me. That's odd, because, I mean, um, Danny, of course, was, was involved with this love police, you know. Um, now... It's funny you should. You were talking about um, your friend at Occupy, who, whose character changed when he went on one of these Tavistock Institute courses. Four. He went on four of them, and his character completely changed. Yeah. And well, that's interesting. You see, uh, Danny Danny Shine used to work with another young man involved with the Love Police, whose name I won't mention, but he was involved in a BBC. He was involved with the BBC. Did some BBC documentary. Did one BBC documentary, and his character changed quite considerably after that as well. Now, Tavistock Institute, I'm sure, are involved. I don't. I mean, I don't know specifically whether they're involved with the BBC, but I'd be very surprised if they're not. Well, I, I, everything that I've been in, well, been and looked at, got involved in. Yeah, I, like when I went to Kew Bridge uh, Eco Village, I went there with a very open head and open heart, and I was like, when I first saw it. It looked like an activist training camp. And I was like, this is something else, something that I really like, I can get involved in. Um, but then you have a look at the type of people that were involved in that, like Dean Puckett, Gareth Newenham. They've just made a film called Crisis of Civilization with, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Nafi Samed, who is part of Chatham House. And that's mm. like, um, you, you may as well say, it's like a another posh version of the Bilderbergs where they, they don't talk about what, what they've done is like first rule of Chatham House is don't talk about Chatham House and that yeah. sort of stuff. And then you find out that Crisis of Civilization is either Rothschild or Rockefeller funded, one of the two. Mm. So you're like, hang on a minute, these are supposed to be protesters that are being funded from the highest echelons of the hierarchy pyramid. And yeah. I was just like, okay, and David Shaler as well. I, I still don't know what to make of that character. Um, mm. First of all, he's a whistleblower, and he blows the whistle on the plot to kill Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, and uh, next thing, he's uh, exiled out of the country. And a few months later, he's allowed back in the country, and all of a sudden, he's a protester, saying 9 11's an inside job. You must believe me, I'm Jesus Christ, while he's wearing a little miniskirt and a thong. So is this all part of what Tavistock would do and how they do it? Because I know Edward Bernays has done some really manipulative things like back in the day when it was mainly men that smoked, he um, he waited and got a load of, um, I don't know what, what, what it was, but it was something to do with some huge women organisation. Yeah, it was one of these, it was one of these feminist, early feminist groups, yeah. And, um, and he gave them a slogan, because slogans work, um, it's, that's all about how to inset it into the mind. Mm. And it was... Um, <clears throat> Something about um, something of peace, lighting for peace or something like that. But the slogan was all to be put into the mind anyway. But he got them all to light cigarettes at a certain time. And then you, you watched the cigarette sales just shoot through the roof. And it was half and half, women and men all going out and buying cigarettes. Yeah, that's So this right. is social engineering at the highest, highest level. Yes. Ed, I mean, Edward Albanese, the malign influence of Edward Albanese has not been fully appreciated by by history um yeah. basically i mean every time you switch on an advert and you, i mean tv adverts for instance or any kind of advert i mean before about 1920 adverts were all pretty much the same you'd get something like uh buy gillette razors they 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 you know they they work better than our rival razors they're better and they 
adverts would treat the potential customer as an intellectual equal to be who could be persuaded rationally as a thinking person that their product was better than another and they would be persuaded to buy it. Bernays came along and that all changed. He introduced psychosexual elements to adver advertising. Um, so this is why you get now you have things like Gillette, the best a man can get with lots of these very masculine psychosexual images like fast cars you know, things like that. It's, it's, um, that all goes back to Edward Albanese. And it's, his ideas are very, very much a part of all kinds of, of everything from just an advert to political speeches to uh, put, you know manifestos in elections and everything. They all go back to this guy. And it's treating people not as um, intellectuals, you know, thinking entities who can be persuaded rationally. It's treating us in the most contemptuous way as um, really sort of almost you know, it's almost behavioural animals who have to be overcome with trickery, with baits and with lures. And I mean, it's completely and utterly legal. It doesn't, it doesn't break any laws to do it. It's considered not, it's not considered immoral by most people to do it. Um, and it's, it's really, if you look, take a step back and look at it with fresh eyes, it's frightening and it's, it's insulting. Um, I've, I've just thought, actually, was Iron Rand anything to do with Tavistock? I don't, I don't know. I, I, but Ayn Rand was um, interesting. I mean, she's got some books. I've read two of her books, actually. Um, I'm not exactly sure where her sort of like... Uh, I knew she was involved with... In America, she was involved with the Committee for Un-American Activities, which was basically rounding people up who... For, for any reason at all, they'd round someone up and say, that person's a communist. Yeah. And, and they'd be treated really badly they could be in prison they could lose their jobs they could even be exiled from the country there was all kinds of things that this uh, this house committee for un-american activities could do i know that ayn rand was a supporter of that yeah I've even just... though in her books she, she professed to be a proponent of freedom and her books are all about freedom you know and, uh, but in fact she was actually work she was very establishment in her own way yeah, if, if anybody wants to actually look for information on, on these type of characters, I'd suggest a good film to watch is... Now, I'll bet you can... I've not even said anything to you, but I'll bet you know what film I'm going to say. Which one? Oh, it's uh, Century of the Self. Yes, Adam Curtis. Yeah, it's a four-hour documentary, but it's got so much information about Tavistock, Bernays, Freud. But I've, I've just found in front of me... Um, some of the corporate clients who Bernays has been accredited to, which are giants like Procter & Gamble, the American mm. Tobacco Company, Cartier, Best Food, CBS, United Fruit Company, General Electric, Dodge Motors, fluoridationists of the Public Health Service. Uh, so mm. these, these are like... Fluoridation. <laughs> And it's just good. The list goes on and on and on. Jewish mental health, blah, blah, blah. And all this, it's like, okay... Now we have a look at our scenes, what we're into, the protest movements, people waking up, and they're in there as well. Yeah. So you've got to start questioning what is the truth. I like, I like to say that I try not to believe anything, and I know very little of what is to know. Because mm. if you believe something, you're following it, and you don't know it for sure. You, you, it's not a fact. It's, yeah. And if you believe something, your beliefs can change from day to day. Yeah. Now... Procter and Gamble, aren't they um, something to do with that big documentary that's floating about at the moment called Thrive? I've not seen that, but I know Procter and Gamble is supposedly a sort of chemical, um, sort of hardware chemical company, but they make Pringles crisps, incidentally. So huh. um, they supposedly they're, they're called things that are fit for human consumption. If you hold a, a lighter to them, they actually catch fire. <laughs> I've never tried that, but I might have to give that one a go. <laughs> That's, yeah, it, it makes um, you should, just don't eat it. I'm a, buy, buy a packet and set fire to them, but don't eat them, whatever you do. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, um, you mentioned uh, the United Fruit Company. That was that. Now that was involved. That's often been a front. That's a front for the CIA. Ooh. The United Fruit Company, because the United Fruit Company was, was was behind the coups in Central America that brought in fascist dictatorships, which killed um, millions of people in South America and other places like that. Well, I've just opened up a link for the United Fruit Company, and they've got a well-suspect front door. Yeah, have you ever heard the phrase Banana Republic? The Banana Republic, I have heard the phrase. It comes from the United Fruit Company. Yeah, yeah. Oh, That's where it comes from. The United Fruit Company is either a CIA front. Okay. Um, 
Right, so where was we? What was we on to just a minute ago? Edward Albanese and... and um, Thrive and how they're getting involved Thrive, with yeah. our sort of scenes. I've and not seen Thrive. I've, I've started watching it. Um, it's a long documentary. It's same old, same old. They're, they're, they're saying stuff, um, which we all been looking into anyway. Um, it's a very interesting, very glitzy documentary for truthers or anyone looking into this stuff, but... Never, never watch a film and then think, yeah, that must be true. That's all right because it it resonates with you. Go and yes. look at the the so called facts and um, look for the truth within it, and also try and discredit it as well because that's how you're going to find your truth is by looking into stuff and not having a belief to it and not having any ties to it. Like yeah. Occupy, I would have loved to have been proved wrong that. It was was nothing more than a social engineering experiment, but yeah. no, nobody could prove that to me because it was, it was so obvious, mm. and I, I'm glad it didn't actually make a huge impact in this country. It w- yeah, what's good? What's good about that is possibly that the reason Occupy was actually created as this experiment, um, if it wasn't created from the beginning, which it could well have been, um, seems likely. Um, if it didn't have much success, it's possible that the uh, the sort of the energies that it was designed to diffuse are still there. Yeah. Which means that there may be, hopefully, there'll be maybe uh, be another similar movement which doesn't, which is actually genuine, and people will actually be on their guard against this kind of thing. Because I mean, the one thing that the um, the authorities have always done is they've tried to get inside their opposition. I mean, there was um, I think it was one of the communist leaders in Eastern Europe. He was once asked, how do you deal with, you know, dissidents and insurgents? And he says, I don't fight them. I offer them a job. Huh. Which is it's an interesting sort of way to put it. But uh, it's kind of what the attitude that, that the, uh, our, our own authorities have towards um, anti-government and activism. They, they sort of like they get inside it and they just turn it into something which is attenuated and soppy and is, is under their thumb. Like, these things can start is in a genuine for a genuine purpose. I mean, I think the Labour the Labour Party, when it was first set up, seems to have been set up by genuine people for a genuine purpose. Yeah. That is to improve the lives for working people in this in this country. But before, I mean, before long, it's in less than a century, it's turned into what Tony Blair is in charge of. You know, this this guy Tony Blair, this yeah. this um this guy who who this warmonger who from the Fabian Society who. Um, Goes around lying through his teeth at every opportunity, drinking sherry with the Queen. You know, it's it, it seems people. It, you look back. I mean, it happens so slowly. We don't even notice it happening. But you look back all over that time. You think, how the hell did that happen? Yeah, and somebody told me about Tony Blair, and somebody pulled it up. Who's actually in the chat room at the moment? Oh, and if anybody's listening to the radio and they want to join in the chat, um, there's a link just above the the radio where it says join the chat. Click on that, put your name in, come and join, come and ask a question. But there's Tommy in the chat, and um, I told him about, uh, I heard that Darren Brown had, um, the the guy that trained him in NLP and his uh, skills Mm. also trained Tony Blair. And Mm. um, he said to me, well, do you know that? And it's like, since then I've been flat out busy. But if anyone can find any information on um, the guy that trained Darren Brown, and then uh, see if there's any matches to this guy and Tony Blair, and then see who else he's trained, because these guys are using these skills of NLP um, to manipulate millions of people, i.e. for voting. And it's like, you know I mean? I'm never going to vote. Why would I? Why would I? Why would you choose? Who are you going to choose? Punch or Judy? It's the same. Exactly. It's the same puppeteer. I mean, it's that, I'd also be interested in anyone who can back up another allegation I heard, which is the BBC. When when the BBC produced um, produced documentaries, they often use NLP experts invo- involved in them too. Because um, one one of the um, you know I heard this when when this friend of Danny Shine was actually on as part of a BBC documentary. Yeah. I heard that what, Charlie Veach. Well, you. <laughs> Your work, your, you named him, not me. But um, yeah, I mean, I heard rumours that um, I heard rumours that some people trained, either either involved with Darren Brown or trained by Darren Brown, or Darren Brown had trained them, were involved in that program. This is just a rumour. I've got no evidence, but if anyone can find me evidence on that, I'd be very grateful. 
Yeah, it would be worth. Would, um, the, the program was called Conspiracy Road Trip 9 yeah. 11. That's it, and it's uh, and it's it's really quite remarkable how that man's character sort of changed after he'd been on that program. And I wonder, I just wonder what went on in that program. I can't. It's it's hard to say. I mean, seeing as I was asked to take part, I mean, not not in that one. I was there was a uh, some follow up programs that came out. Did you see the follow up ones, the seven seven road trip and the UFO road trip? Did yeah. You see uh, do you know what I saw that? I've met um, John that was on the seven seven one. Mm. Um, he's from Birmingham. Uh, we are change. I think he was. He was in, mm. um, and he, he stayed strong all the way through it. And they must have had hours of footage. And the thing is, they can have hours of footage and manipulate it. And John seemed to stay pretty strong all yeah. the way through with his views. And they didn't make him look bad at all. Did you know, I was, uh, yeah, I was asked to take part in that series myself. I was asked, they, they wrote to me and asked me if I wanted to be involved in the series. And I wrote back and I said, sure, I'd love to come on board, but could you please, I'd like to examine your correspondence with the commissioning editor of the BBC, please. The reason I, well, <laughs> the reason I want to know this is because um, I'm very concerned about the very poor quality of programmes made on these subjects in the past. Other part from that, I'd be happy to be involved. You know what, they never wrote back. <laughs> you know, the reason they never wrote back was because if, they, if, they, if they'd allowed me to see their proposal to the commissioning editor of the BBC... It would be very obvious they were designed to write a hit piece to make us look like clowns. That was their entire that was their entire sort of remit. Well, this is one reason why um, you know I mean I've, I've, I wouldn't expect them ever to put me on telly ever, but um, one of the reasons I don't think I finished, uh, especially this year, is because of um, you're breaking up a bit, Dom. You're breaking up slightly. Sorry, mate. Um, yeah, what I was saying was I don't expect Occupy to be anywhere near finished this year because um, Charlie Skelton contacted me the other week and I went off to meet him we had a four hour meeting where he asked me absolutely everything about Occupy and uh, said that this was for a Channel 4 program that they're doing Mm. and um, Charlie Skelton writes for The Guardian and he also writes for um 8 out of 10 cats. He does a was lot this, of Was stuff. this the guy you were going to go and see when you got entertained by the police and when you were searched by the police? What? Sorry to interrupt, sorry. What? Um, From you Occupy? Made, um, you, no, you know that you were going to the sun. No, you were going to see someone of the uh, sun. No, sorry. that was somebody completely different. And, yeah. And um, that, that was something else completely different. Charlie Skelton. Apologies, yeah, apologies. I broke your, yeah, carry on, apologies. Yeah, Charlie Skelton's a Guardian reporter who has reported on the Bilderberg meetings and been arrested for it. All right. So his wife went a couple of years later and she got arrested too. And um, yeah. they seem like the only genuine um, journalists I've ever met in my life. And mm. they gave myself and John Whitterick an interview and they put that into The Guardian. And um, John Whitterick stuff was all about how to get out of debt, links to his website. And it all got left up there. And my stuff was all about... Um, you are not you're, the name on the birth certificate. If you don't consent to be part of that system, there are ways of playing the game and you can be free. And they put it all out there. Next day, I'm getting phone calls off of Charlie and they're saying they're getting loads of hassles off of um, their legal team that shouldn't have gone in there, blah, blah, blah. It's like I just thought it was hilarious because like there was finally a bit of true information in the papers and... They tried to rebut it, which cost them tens of thousands of pounds. And when they rebut it, it, it just gave us more energy because more people looked at the information. So it's like yeah. epic fail for the system. And that's, yeah, good. that's the way I'm seeing the system at the moment. Everything that they're doing to try and hold on to their power, they can't. Too many people yeah. are waking up and going, I'm not standing for this no more. The power mm. is me. I've got the power. And that's exactly. why people shouldn't join up with groups and go, yeah, I'm part of this group, because like you might be part of that group, go and sign your name down, yeah, I'm part of Anonymous, I'm part of Occupy, and then somebody with a daft mask goes out and does a bomb, or even a false flag, or whatever, in the name of that, then you're all labelled, and then cheers, because you're claiming to be the 99%, even though 99% of this country has never heard of you, then like <laughs> you're going to take it to the High Court, once you go through the High Court, everyone will have to follow that as a rule and then you're yeah. taking away people's rights and um, perceived freedoms yes that's a that's a that's an interesting words of warning there for people because i mean it wouldn't it's anyone can put on one of those masks and do something heinous 
And um, it wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't surprise, I mean, we already, already know that the English Defence League have done this. And it's quite likely that other, you know, the police probably do this as well. And they've done it in other, they've done this in other protests. They've dressed up like a particular member of a group and they've gone out and they caused trouble. And then that gives them, it's a, it's, a, it's a little sort of 9-11 really. It gives them an excuse to then, to then go in and solve this problem that they created. Yeah. And to, to take vengeance against whoever it was. And um, it's it's uh, what was you saying? What sort of what you were saying before that? It was um, yeah. I mean the, the the thing about the mainstream media. I mean people like this guy from the Guardian you mentioned, um, yeah. Charlie Charlie Skelton. Skelton. Yeah. Charlie Skelton. I mean it, we're reaching a point now where people like him who, who they may be working for mainstream papers, but they won't. They're, they're, there's a, there's maybe enough of a critical mass now to keep these people in work and keep them what they're doing, keep them on what they're doing. Up till now, I mean, people like Jim Tucker, you know, the independents have been the only people exposing the Bilderberg. But obviously, you know, they they will always try to persecute people within an organisation who mm -hmm. uh, don't follow the party line. I mean, um, as they would do with the Guardian or any other mainstream paper. There's a, there's a limit to how much they can do. They can't control people by force. They can only keep control people by forcing them, by persuading them to cooperate. Yeah, that's what you know, I they, keep telling people is like, the, the final thing is, because it, they can't force you to um, sign a piece of paper. Now, that's how they get you on a contract. So yeah. they might be able to force photos out of you. They might be able to force fingerprints out of you, but they can't force you to sign a piece of paper. Mm. So this is, um, well, where they get people like um, the Tavistock Institute, Common Purpose, and all these other think tanks in there to program people and train them how to like do their job. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll see it time and time again. You can go up to Popper with an intention um, of just asking questions. Try it out. Just go up to a cop and start asking questions. Ask a question. And then ask a question after a question after a question. See how many questions you can ask before they start asking questions back. It's part of their programming. They can't help it. They cannot have hold a normal conversation without being in their job. But you know, you you actually uh, the the guy was it Ginger, the guy with the beard, um, Rocco. Rocco, that's it, Rock. He um he actually came. It, it, he, if he, he is he listening, saw... if he is listening, I'd like to say a big big hello to Niall, uh, my favourite YouTube cop. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he actually came back and he started actually talking a bit of sense to you. And I thought, this guy's starting to get it. And I thought, you've broken through. You've actually got through to this guy. Well, the, the funny thing is, um, yeah, I, I, when I used to have a spy camera, it's a lot easier to catch good footage because they don't know they're being filmed. But now I've got a camera, it's like holding a, a taser to them. They, they get frightened. They know they're being filmed. They know they haven't got these answers, which seem very simple. And they should know because they are allegedly police mm. so they, they don't know about their own job and then they get a bit aggy like you say with this um ginger guy and um sometimes they can wrestle you to the floor take you to the station um just for asking questions and trying to find out what's what within the law but he did he did he's, he's looking into this information and um i know for a fact that bristol police station troll my youtube channel and mainly on that ginger uh video which is called um arrested for asking about common law part one and part two and yeah. th the police i've been told that they do hit that channel and um send nasty comments in there so this is like what they do they try and put other people off looking at it because the first few comments that stay at the top people do tend to look down and think oh no this is going to be rubbish and then skip onto another video or something so you lose yeah. a lot of people by by the way they work this is psychological warfare, what, what they do and, and who trains them. Yeah, it's, I mean, I know exactly what you mean because I've been targeted by uh, an entire group of trolls for about five years now they've been after me. Um, Team Droik is an absolutely infamous group of trolls. Um, they just basically, they post, um, I used to think it was just one person and they always have the same sort of like forum account on my forum, but then I noticed that some days they're better at spelling than others and things like that. They use different kinds of, their, their punctuations sort of varies. And I realize it's more than one person and they're always there. I mean, it seems like they work shifts. I mean, I never have to, it, it's just every two hours, you know, something is put up on there, which I have to then delete. And they put comments on my blog articles, things like that, you know, but um, it's, I did, I got a chance to talk to a, to a solicitor about contracts and things like that. And I, I brought up the, the birth certificate and I said, um, cause of course the birth certificate, is supposedly the contract between us and the state. That's what well, it's supposed it's, to be. 
Well, that's always it's, told, yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, but um, yeah. it doesn't even have your baby footprint on or baby handprint. It doesn't have, let alone a signature. Yeah. You know, so and I brought this up and he said, well, it doesn't really matter. It's, um, and he sort of kept saying to me, it doesn't really matter what, whether that's contract law or not. It's just the fact that that is how the law works. And I thought, that's a bit of an odd thing to say. <laughs> you know, and I thought, it's, I, I don't think he quite grasped my point. Even though he was a solicitor and he's trained in law, I'm not. Well, that's why I'm I'm seeing coppers every day and saying to them, are we policed by consent? And they say, well, yeah. And it's like, okay, so if we don't consent to said rules, then what what happens then? Oh, you still get nicked. <laughs> so it's, it's not by consent, then it is by force. Or, mm. or your job is, is um, done by force. Maybe not the contract as such, because I know for a fact that the police unfortunately, haven't got any authority anymore. When um, they were started by um, Robert Pill, it was um, to protect people and to look after the neighbourhoods and things like that. But mm-hmm. nowadays, it's all about commerce. Yeah. I mean, I, could, I, do, I do what happened to the good old British Bobby, you know, the guy with the little watch chain who said evening all, you know, um, who sort of escorted lady, old ladies across the road. That's now... He was a guardian of the community, that man. Do you know what I mean? He was someone everyone looked up to and you could trust. He's been replaced by some sort of like, sort of armoured assassin in a luminous jacket with a belt kit full of weapons. And you sort yep. of, you ask him to cross, you ask him the time of day, he says, time you got to watch, mate. You know, something like that. Well, they, they look terrifying, all in that black sort of like Kevlar gear, bulletproof with weapons and they, they look like futuristic Nazis. But the thing is... <laughs> Maybe they are. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, they've got no authority and power at all. I've got the power to arrest. Well, take me down the station, mate, but at the end of the day, you can ask me like thousands of questions, but you got thrown out at some point. It's not you that has to make the decisions. It's the courtroom. So mm. I'll deal with it there and then, mate. You know what I mean? You lot are just fancy dress to me yeah it, it's it's very much it's a psychological attack on us it's um and it, pl- it, it plays on our ignorance it depends on our ignorance uh-huh mm. well we're going to go to a couple of tunes in a minute because it's coming up to the hour and okay. um what i'm going to do is try and get hold of somebody to bring him in because he had some information on common purpose but cool. I'd like, like you to stay on if you can, Ben, so we sure. can have a freeway conversation. Sure, that would be great. All right, then. Uh, if Bob could line up a tune for us. Yeah, yeah, it's that fourth stage. Check the cool chances. What will you attract this day? Under influx, true separation, I'll see everyone as kids. Respect to rock, call it rope, bimbo. Let road rage pass or shout, fuck you out the window. Get let out or cut off, it's your choices to shape your reality. Universal forces, don't take them lightly. Nah. Cause you might be surprised if you choose wisely with good vibes. Yeah. Negative vibes subside, yeah. don't let the mud slide, bury you. Dust yourself up, whistle a merry tune. I feel blessed, that's very true. My light shine bright, I take flight like an airy you Break out the catch and taste freedom. When you realize those bars are holding you back, you won't need them. Although we can't delete them, we can focus on the things we do want and then we can reap them. Same thing you feel is the same thing that comes. Bang, bang on the drum, move to the bump. Same thing came as the same thing called. Bang, bang, you win it all when you play more. Main thing attraction, magnetic action. Same thing you would have done while relaxing. Same thing seen when plans put into action. Bang, bang. You win it all when you practice it. Magnetic flow, no handset. Man get remotely controlled. Mind bandits work through your food on your sandwich. Don't you know this? Gia no consume, no Gia on food. Just so you know, dude, not being rude. I don't drink tap water in tea. I'll have juice, please. Far gin energy boosts me. Formed on the two speeds, inward appearance, similar to Bruce Lee's. Get those plus signs flowing, pineal glowing. Indigos are violent to lie, you know it. If you're happy, then show it. Clap your hands for the moment of now, no opponent. Can't check the shadow, yet we still postpone it. Try to own it, try and disown it. It's not too late, you ain't blown it. You're a powerful being, it's just you've never known it. Same thing you feel, it's the same thing that comes. Bang, bang. 
Hands on the drum, move to the bump. Same thing came as the same thing caused. Bang, bang, you win it all when you play more. Main thing attraction, magnetic action. Same thing, you were the dumb while relaxing. Same thing seen when plans put into action. Bang, bang, you win it all when you practice it. The things, the ideas, the beliefs, the concepts, the experiences, the opportunities, whatever you wish to call them, that are vibrating in alignment with your true core self are already doing their utmost to be attracted to you. The ideas, the synchronicities, the beliefs, the vibrations, the opportunities, the situations, the circumstances that are not aligned with that core radiant signature frequency that is your true self are doing their utmost to get away from you. The only reason the things that are attempting to get to you don't get to you is that you're keeping them away. The only reason the things that are attempting to get away from you don't get away from you is you are holding on to them and not letting them go. You don't actually have to learn how to attract. You don't actually have to learn how to repel. You just have to learn to let in and you have to learn to let go. That's all you need to do. Now you can see with this analogy that you are floating around as individuals in a sea of whirlpools and vortices and eddies that are attempting to locate you. And as you allow them to come in, you will allow them to swirl and spiral into you. And as soon as they begin to swirl and spiral in, when you allow those other things to swirl and spiral out, you will make room for those things that belong with you and give freedom to those things that don't instead of keeping them prisoner in your dungeon of pain and sorrow and suffering. This is why you have the phrase on your planet, misery loves company. With every breath in, you are attracting and allowing attraction. With every exhalation, you are letting go of that which is not yours. And with every breath out, you feel the enlightenment and the weight lifting, and you become light as light itself. Free to be who you choose to be to take in what you prefer to take in and let out what is not you. Welcome, welcome back to the second hour, everyone. And I've pulled another guest in to talk about Common Purpose. For the people that don't know who Common Purpose are, then get to know. Common Purpose is an international, non-for-profit organisation that's been running leadership development courses. That's what they say. So they're training people to be tomorrow's leaders. Um, this is saying they're non-profit when they have tens of thousands of people um, going on these courses, costing £10,000 average each, or, or up to 10000 The Matrix course costs 10000 and I know that people have done that and done it a few times and then go out and manipulate with in protests. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there, yeah, I'm Jake. Um, basically, recently, um, straight up, Common Purpose came to my college. They were using the title Common Purpose, and they were just giving um, employability lessons to help yourself get employed in big businesses and stuff like that. And you know, it was mandatory; you had to do it. Uh, when I left it, you know, I, I, remember, I remember hearing Common Purpose before, and I just thought, you know, let's look this up. It's a bit creepy. And uh, um, I, I just got looking into it, and um, I realised quite a few people local were common purpose, and I realised that there were quite a few graduates and quite a few teachers based in my local area, Suffolk. So I, I just gave one of them a ring and said, um, the woman who was doing the course, Jessica Watts, was um, said, if I had any questions, I could just give you a ring and... Um, talk about it and he said yeah you can come like give me, um, come to me and so we like had a meeting got and he was just another really creepy bastard I didn't ask him any questions because like any awkward questions because um, 
you know, it was just quite uncomfortable. But it's just amazing how in our community they are. It's like everywhere you go. That's so they're, they're coming into colleges and grabbing them young by the sounds of it. Yeah. So you because you contacted me the other day and, and showed me this uh, list of quite powerful people. Explain what that was. Um, well, I was left alone in um, Chief Executive's office for the police whilst I was talking to him. And, um, well, I found an address book. It was just on his desk. So I was like, just flicked through it, you know. That's what you do when you're investigating. And um, there, there, there was a name on it. Oh, I did write my name down, but I can't find it. But And it said, get to join um, three-year plan. And I, I looked that up, and I, I found um, the chief executive, Michael Gooch, on that list, and I found he was one of the only people to respond to it. Yeah. So, so what was this list called again? Um, the three-year plan. Uh, I've got it up somewhere. Uh, yeah, if we hold on, why, why you find that? Because um, maybe if other people Google this and see this, then you'll you'll see like what, what this list is and who's on it. These are very high-powered people in society that are connected to common purpose. And when you have a look at these guys, they're they're involved in all sorts from the the NHS. Uh, everything in the public service sector, schools, healthcare, lawyers, media, um, everywhere they're, they're, they're in there. Doing exactly the same. Well, they've come off of things like think tanks off the Tavistock Institute, and they're, they're there, trained to socially engineer and manipulate um, crowds with their, their psychoactive where they're just manipulating with keywords, slogans, anchors, mirroring, and the sort of things that these mind benders want to do to get you to do what they want you to do. Have you found that list yet? Yeah, it's a Suffolk three year plan. It's free spelled out. So if, if people Google the Suffolk three year plan, you'll find it. 2015. Yeah, it's 2012 to 2015, and this will have the list of these on. So when, when you got this list, what, what did you do with it? Um, I just started Google, Googling some of the RSPVs, um, people who had responded already on it. And again, all of these, well, not all of them, because some of them, are, they just had no information on web at all. But some of them have like got connections with common purposes, either being like, a graduate or just being around other graduates or being around other leaders and teachers. Yeah, so somebody just, are you going to talk then? Because somebody just posted in the chat room that uh, there's a common purpose graduate, uh, Jessica Watts, I don't know who she is or anything. Is there a reason for somebody posting that in there? Carry on. Me? Um, I've not heard that name before. No, not if I... Um, I'm not Jessica Watts. I found this from Suffolk. It's it's this. I'm just posting it in the in the um, in the Skype box yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, it's that's, just that's Suffolk Police Authority. It's oh, a, it's it's a Suffolk that. Police Authority. Yeah, it's just there's a link there now. SuffolkPoliceAuthority.org.uk documents. Okay. Um, and also, like I, I found on the Common Purpose Graduates list, this was through searching once again from Occupy. Um, that when they, they started at um, St Paul's Cathedral, then they went and took a bit of land at uh, um, Finsbury Square, and then they took a building called the Bank of Ideas, which we found to be a registered limited company three years ago. So this has all been in part of for a long time. And then the woman that found um, the Bank of Ideas handed it over to a guy called Phoenix who's well known on the squatting scene and the protesting scene he's he's wanted to change the squatting law for some time and uh, it seems like he has changed the squatting law now it's um, illegal to squat uh, residential buildings and this is down to the Bank of Ideas court case in the High Court they're actually quoting this on other court cases like there was one, the Hobo Hill one and they quoted the Bank of Ideas and said right, we don't care if there's mistakes in this this one's gone through so 
this is in the lower port, we're going to pass this one through. Anyway, the woman that found it, her, her name was um, Eleanor Wilson, and she runs Passing Cloud, which is like an activist hub network where loads of people gather and they tell them all their information and everything like that. But lo and behold, there's an Eleanor Wilson that's a Common Purpose graduate. So we've done a bit more digging, and it's quite hard to find out who this Eleanor Wilson is. And there's only 56 Eleanor Wilsons in the country, so what would the odds be of this one, who is actually in a position of leadership, uh, got our fingers in pies of lawful rebellion, occupy, transition towns, Grove Heathrow, Kew Bridge, 9-11, you name it, she's there. And um, going to festivals and things like that, also involved with community projects up and down the country. It, it makes me worried because... These community projects, I know of some that have got some high-profile activists trying to set communities up, and they've got common purpose fingers in, in the pies, by it seems. So if this is happening, I hope we don't have another Waco or Ruby Ridge on our hands. It could be. I mean, I've what you often find is these, they run in families. You know, um, what happens is... Oh, Dom, I can hear myself echoing slightly. I'm not sure if, if that's normal or what. Sorry, that, that was me just uh, unplugging my headphones and back in. <laughs> oh, sorry. Now, I was going to say, I, I met a lady called Kathy Morgan, and I spoke to her for a long time, and um, she's an interesting lady because she comes from, she has a family background, and in, she she's a little bit unsure about her own family background, but she knows, she's told me some interesting stories about how they're involved in, with um, various sort of like these organisations and think tanks going back you know, quite a number of years, she's traced her family back um, to the 19th century. And um, she's got some lot of interesting stories to tell, like how she, she, she's a bit unsure, like she has missing time. I think she has, um, you know, maybe she, she comes across as someone quite, uh, maybe psychologically damaged. Do you know what I mean? But she, um, she was involved in festivals and things like that as well. And I wonder if there's some connection there between her and the kind of things that Jake was just talking about. Okay. And what, sorry, what you were just talking about, Dom. Oh, right, because I'm like, um, looking into a few things with festivals at the moment because I get quite involved with a lot of festivals. I know quite a lot of the crew, and there's many, many great people I've, I've met at festivals doing what I do, and I help out. And um, I'm going way back to things like Green Gathering, where they got shut down a few years ago. Uh, they handed the licence back, and it, this is all under the director's orders. There was no court order or anything like that. It was all threats and word, and nobody stood up to it. They threatened to take um, their whole livelihood and house and everything off them. So instead of having a court case, they dropped it and stopped the festival there and then. But now it's up in the air because people want to know, because Mark Kennedy was so involved, um, the undercover cop, and he's been exposed, that was it people like him that have gone in there uh, with this sort of information that crunched down uh, a gathering and um, stopped people trying to live freely and teach people actual remedies. Because you go to these gatherings or festivals, you can go to hundreds of different workshops and learn skills of how to be free from this corrupt system. But the government, they don't want people to have gatherings or festivals. They want to have, have as much divide and rule as possible. Absolutely. I mean, in 1984, there was a very, very brutal event, the Battle of the Beanfield. 88. Which, uh, was it 88, I think? It was, was it 88. 88. It was, it was sometime uh, in the 1980s. I might be wrong. And, I might be wrong. Whatever, whatever time it was. I mean, I thought it was in the 70s. But there may have been another incident in the 70s. But there's no doubt that the government have clamped down on, on people. They've used exclu excuses like, uh, um, you know, uh, um, trespassing, you know, noise, pollution, things like that. But basically, they want to clamp down on people who are a threat to them. And that means people who they are not necessarily challenging the government, but are living independently from the government. The government want us dependent on them. They want us to need them. They want us to live lives in which our society is completely under their umbrella. And our very livelihood is held clutched in their fingers, which they can drop at a moment's notice when they feel like it. Yeah. And they hate anyone who is, is, is trying to teach people how to break away like you were just saying. Yeah. And, and in the Battle of the Beanfield, they actually sent, I think, 4,000 police officers. 4,000! It was one of the biggest police operations in history to crush um, a, a group of peaceful hippies, as they called them, uh, you know, travellers, um, independent, free-thinking people who were on their way to Stonehenge. And they, they used to 
whacked people over the head with truncheons, even even women holding babies, and they they trashed their their, their vehicles. The order it was a was, horrific event. The order was to smash every vehicle, which was their homes, and um, drag them out and make as many arrests as possible. And the thing is that that destroyed destroyed a huge community gathering of people that had gathered up. Um, and there was festivals going on and gatherings were up to 20,000 people. These weren't like Gastonbury, £150 a ticket. These were gatherings of people arranged to, to meet. And um, that, that beanfield was absolutely disgusting. And yeah. I was told a story by um, somebody who was part of what is called the Wally tribe, which stems from a guy called Wally Hope. Now, this is really interesting to anyone that's into this legal lawful information because Wally Hope wasn't the name that he was given at birth. He realised that um, you are not the name that they have registered and that's how what ties you to the system. And if you don't realise this, then you're a Wally. I'm a Wally. Everyone's a Wally. And that's what he said. And the phrase, where's Wally, in the cartoon and all that, come from this guy, Wally. Because um, if you go to the gatherings and Stonehenge, You'll go to Stonehenge and you'll hear Wally being cried all over the place. Wally, Wally, Wally. And this is in respect to this guy because I can't see it any other way than the government bumped him off. Um, he went and started a free festival on a festival field at Stonehenge, which did end up moving to the, the bean field. And um, this guy, after the gathering had finished and everything, and the police served orders and all that malarkey, they've said, right, you're going to have to get off this piece of land now. And um, he said, well, what do you mean by this piece of land? And they said, well, don't get funny with us. And he said, well, no, what do you mean? And he said, right, anywhere outside of this fence, that's what it says. So he's climbed over the fence, climbed over the next fence into another field and said, what are you going to do now then? And they said, well, come on, don't, don't play silly buggers with us. And he said, no, seriously, what would you have to do? And he said, well, we'd have to go and serve another court order. And he was like, well, crack on then. And then like, that's how it all started. He went from field to field. Um, he went and squatted down in Amesbury, which is near Stonehenge. And um, from there, they were looking for an army to serve because there's a few army barracks around the area. They, they raided his squat and they went through his pockets. Of course, an army to serve is going to be hiding in his pockets, aren't they? Yeah. But they found a few acid. And then they took him to prison, put him on remand. Whilst he was on remand, they sent a nurse down and they said to him, are you um, your birth name today or are you Wally? Uh, you seem a little confused. We're going to section you and stuff a load of drugs in your system. And they done that and he choked on his own vomit and died. And the festival went on and on and built in numbers until the bean field. And they're ho hoping to get somebody on from the Wally tribe within the next couple of weeks to talk about this more in depth. Because it's a really interesting story that um, I got to know more about when I met Lockie at Stonehenge a couple of years ago. And we met this guy who was uh, a Wally, who was carrying about Wally Hope's ashes box 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And oh. he told us this whole story and I thought, you are amazing, mate. I thought, well, I'd love to get you on camera and talk this story. At the time, I only had a little spy camera, and it had no battery. And I just saw it as, well, the universe doesn't want this information within our realms at the moment. But it is definitely interesting to look up Wally Hope, uh, the Battle of the Beanfield, and uh, the Wally Tribe. It's uh, very, very, very interesting stuff. Oh, that's really, that's a very poignant story and very interesting, too, because where's Wally? On Strange enough, when I was a little kid, I remember the, the bean field, although I didn't know what it was at the time because I was just a little kid. But I heard it on the news, and of course, it was all biased. But oddly enough, there was a there was a song out which I remember very distinctly. It's I could even sing it to myself called "Everyone's a Wally," and it was connected to some kind of computer game. I think when I was a little kid, um, "Everyone's a Wally," la 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 la, and I can't remember all the lyrics, but it was um, it was just a little song, but. Um, Talking about, you see exactly what you were saying about the free festivals, how they, you know, how things like Glastonbury now are kind of yuppie commodity. You know, you have to pay a fortune to get in, and it's elitist thing now. But well, the thing about the free festivals, they were run off a barter economy. And um, a lot of these people had independent sort of like economies and stuff like that. And um, I read a brilliant, there was a, it's, a, it's, in, it's a book by, oddly enough, it's by a cryptozoologist, Jonathan Downs, a guy who goes hunting Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and things like that. But he's very into this kind of thing as well. And he's written a brilliant art, a little sort of like commentary in one of his books. 
on the Battle of the Beanfield and how, you know, how it was something so progressive and something so f- a piece of genuine freedom, which they couldn't control it. Like it's not like Occupy where they had um, all these various organisations and Tavistock institutes and people like that involved. This was something genuine. So because they because it wasn't infiltrated, because it wasn't controlled by them, they destroyed it with force. This is this is an and of course they 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 portrayed it as basically they use words in the news like I remember them, I remember even as that age thinking trespass you know noise pollution things like that they kept saying that's what it was all about they sent in four thousand police officers for about two thousand to, to you know for just a, a group of about two thousand people which is talk about sledgehammer to crack a nut yeah and I'd I'd imagine what they'd use in the court cases all that they had like. Things like weapons, like axes and machetes. These were people that were living, and they, they need to chop wood with things like that. So it's this, yeah. once again, if they, they raid um, a, a Muslim family, and then like say, well, they, they were uh, linked to terrorism, and they had lots of bomb-making material. What, bleach and flour? Tell me one house <laughs> that hasn't got bleach and flour in it. Yeah, this is crazy, it's ridiculous. It's very sad, it's, it, it's an interesting tale, but it's very, very sad. Yeah. Is, is Jake still there? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, do you know anything about this uh, bean field and the rest of it? Well, I think I wasn't born when it happened. But I, I, like, I've seen it, a couple of videos on, on YouTube and I just thought it was, you know, police state kind of Orwellian looking. Let's see, invade. See, I've been to. Stonehenge a couple of times and um, I was living in the woods there a couple of years ago and the police were actually really nice and um, you know I mean they're just there doing a job now and they know that there's no gathering of people that's going to ever give that system a threat again like it did back in the 80s but that is um, the way I see it is they've took a big chunk out of humanity and community in this country by that action and uh, they, they just couldn't have it because imagine if people did start doing or, or just goes, well, all right, then that is your system, have your system. And then they, they went and built their own community, um, much like what, what I've tried to do, people are trying to do is just go back to the land, um, start. If you, if you see a bit of land that's not being used, why not go and do a bit of guerrilla gardening on it? And then, like, if you've got things coming through, crops coming through, you've got stuff that you can either give away to your local neighbourhood, which is organic and GM-free, and you, you, you're going to make friends instantly by that. And it's uh, a friendly currency rather than this fiat currency that's going about that just enslaves people the more and more it gets used. I just don't get what's gone on in humanity and why we've let this happen. Why haven't people stood up and said... I've had enough of this en masse because you see people at home going, oh, oh, I'm sick of this. Oh, well, they make you do this and they make you do that. Well, why do you put up with it? Because they tell you, yeah, you have to do this and they tell you you have to do that. But it's you that actually abides by their stupid rules. And if if you don't follow the rules, then they'll send someone around and then you've got a court case and then you, you'll have to pay a fine. And that's all controlled by fear. Because you don't know how to play the game, so therefore they do. They created the rules, and they expect you to play without them. And they can control you very, very easily. That is such an important point. We often talk about hearing, well, the, the power, the power of the government, the power of the authorities. They have no power. They play a passive role. We are the ones with the power. They, they play a passive role by directing us and telling us what to do with our power and we just do it and we, we just do what they want it's like a, it's like a mouse leading an elephant and the elephant saying all right mr mouse i'll go this way if you want me to all right mr mouse i'll go that way if you want you to if the elephant said um mr mouse i don't want to go down that way i'm going this way how exactly is the mouse going to force that elephant to go the way it wants to go yeah you can't and i mean you don't i mean little simple things that anyone can do could break the power that this mouse has. I mean, for, for instance, I mean, one thing anyone could do, right, is when you're going to the shops, um, instead of going to Tesco's or one of the big corporations, go to a small local business. That alone, if, if, if enough people do that, that alone will be a major contribution to, yeah. to, to real freedom in this country. It would be enormously 
give your money to a small local business rather than a corporation. That's yeah. that's something you can do. Really important. And um, also, see, also, somebody in the chat room has mentioned about Dale Farm, which is a community that uh, only got broken down. What was it? Uh, year before last, um, about the same time as Occupy uh, started up. It was all going through court, and they were trying to get loads of protesters to go and support Dale Farm. But the thing is, they had already used all their propaganda tools of the media and saying, yeah, you've got this dirty bunch of travellers living on a piece of land freely, not paying tax, blah, 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 blah and all the rest of the stuff they use. And um, the protesters they had there were the likes of Dean Puck and Gareth Newham and Andy Baker. These were the ones that have been well involved with Occupy, Q Bridge, and uh, Democracy Village was another one. If anyone knows about Democracy Village, which was set up by the people from Q Bridge and Professor Chris Knight. And mm. to me, the only reason that Democracy Village was put there was to disrupt Brian Hall and uh, RIP Brian Hall, somebody yeah. that was at Parliament doing something off of his own back for 10 years in a tent, just had enough of the wars and he felt like he had to do something. But after being there for so long, they had to go and attack, attack, attack. And, like, Democracy Village were like, we're going to be here forever. Rah, 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 rah. But as soon as Brian Hoare had his extra court cases, fell ill with cancer, probably through stress, or, or then again, he, he smoked a... And i um, sick of that sort of thing going on. Yeah. You but, mentioned transition towns as well. Yeah. Transition towns is... A, I know transition towns very attached. He's very, very connected to the climate campaign yep you know the guy what's his name um hopkins is it mr Hop, somebody hopkins who's involved who's in charge of it oh i don't, I don't know who's in charge what climate camp yeah no um the transition towns i don't, I don't know who's in charge but go on go on go ahead um now they they're one of these people who, who set themselves up as they i think they're based in devon and they, they set up this kind of like a community which is supposed to be sort of sustainable and eco-friendly but they are connected to the climate debate, and the climate debate is in turn connected to. It is an authoritarian thing. Yeah. It's, um, anything to. Yeah. Promote climate change. Um, yeah. And then like, we can tax the air that people breathe, and we'll call it carbon tax. So people fall for it because it's propaganda. You put it out and they say, well, because of all the oil we've used on the planet. We've heat reached peak oil, and um, the air's all nasty because of we're polluting it. This is all man-made, so therefore we're going to have to do something about it. And what's the solution? Tax people. It's all about money. So um, you, you look at um, climate camp, uh, Bro Heathrow, transition towns, and they all are all linked. And I was just about to say something that somebody said in the chat room. It's Agenda 21 policies. These are promoting something that looks really good, like a green, sustainable future. Great, right, I'm all down with that. Be green, do things green. But when they put it in a policy and make rules out of it, if you do not follow this, then you are fined, taxed, and imprisoned. They've done it to people with things like wheelie bins. Wheelie bins are uh, over full. Then people have been fined for it. This is how dark it's getting. So if your wheelie bins over full, what were you supposed to do? Like... Put, put your stinky rubbish like in a cupboard or something. I, I don't get it. What, what, what they're saying the solution is. What one man can throw out less than the next man can throw out. Like if he throws out too much, he's going to have to pay a penalty. This is Orwellian uh, gone mental. Hey, the, the, the thing with the wheelie bin is just outrageous. I mean, it's one of these things that if you could go, you go back in time, if you go back in time 10 or 15 years and you could say to people, this is what's going to be happening in the future, they'll say, you must be joking. That's, that's crazy. But look, it's happened. That's it's it. Somehow it has happened. The same with making people work for no money. You know, um, this is another thing that really gets me started. Um, they, they're making people who are out of work. Um, do non unpaid work, unpaid jobs. Now, the ethical and practical problems with that are so huge that I can't even begin. It's, it's hard to know where to start. And it's been it's something that's been suggested since the welfare state first began in the 1940s. Uh, but it's never really got past the sort of planning stage because of these various issues and because it's completely unsustainable uh, morally and practically. Um, but somehow now it's happened. Yeah, you, there's, there's thousands. There's what? There's eight hundred 
thousand people or more in this country working for no money. Oh, the oh, thing is, two um, people I know, a friend of mine is on one of these courses, or they're called courses. Yeah, well, what's going the, on? The thing is, how, how they focus this, this stuff through, as, as we exposed with um, Occupy. And then if you look up um, what a Delphi technique is, it's a, it's a way of manipulating consensus voting, where you've got a certain amount of people that are all there that knows what they have to vote through, and they're there with a facilitator, so the facilitator knows who to point to for questions and things like that. And by the end, everyone's voting through what they don't know what they're voting through. It's uh, the patterns of things. And the Delphi technique was created by the Rand Corporation. And um, I, I noticed all this going on. But if you go to council meetings, when they need to pass things through to the public, then like they will have people there doing this Delphi technique so then they can pass it through. And if you look up Delphi technique Agenda 21, this has been heavily um, exposed over America where they're having Agenda 21 meetings to pass through this green agenda. And then people are turning up and saying, no, 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 we're not having this. We know what this is about. And then the people that are, are standing up, uh, much like Down Occupy, if you stood up things Down Occupy and said, no, I'm not having this, you could get arrested for speaking in my mind. And people were getting arrested on this, exposing that. So I'm going to go to a meeting which I've had a look at in the local paper uh, where I'm at at the moment. Um, in the Tottenham area, they're, they're shutting down a lot of police stations. And um, there was some Harry Gay Gazette or something this week, which I saw outside of Tesco's, picked it up, and it had about a police on the front page. And they're getting their, their um, police station shut down and all the rest of it. But they're having meetings. Um, across the boroughs this week there's one tuesday this week um if people want to contact me then i'll tell them where it is and um we can go along to it because i want to see if they're going to try and vote something through and use this consensus process but it's a police meeting so what, whatever they want to vote or pass through could be very very interesting indeed but i, I want to go to these police um community talks and what they want to say to the public and um just see how it goes. You'll be able to see if they get up to any dirty tricks. You'll be able to spot it. Well, I've, I've got, like, um, it's quite a sensitive bullshit radar. And um, <laughs> it, it does come up quite intense sometimes. And sometimes I can keep my mouth shut and, and watch it and evaluate it. And I'll have to put my finger on it. But I know what's going on, like, much with I was seeing it all going on. And I... But I didn't know the Delphi technique. I didn't know that the Tavistock Institute were involved. I didn't know that Common Purpose were running the GAs. I didn't know that Sky News and uh, BBC were acting as protesters running the press team. So, like, I didn't know the security team was run by a guy that enforces uh, or instructs high court, um, the high court bailiffs. So this is like, these are people that come in, put themselves in self-appointed positions, and they're the highest in their, their elite circles anyway. So if, if I'm noticing this, and then like I get all the evidence once I, I, I found it, and then point it out to them, I'm, I'm not scared of no man. So I will go there and say, hey, look, oh, you're common purpose. Now, if you're paid to be there as common purpose, then like you're not going to punch me in the face. But um, I did get a bit of violence down at Occupy, but that was from an ex-copper. And that was for saying that all the donation money was going to climate camp. And it was going to climb the camp. So I wanted like, a few answers on that. I didn't want to be strangled for it and arrested, but that's just a whole nother story. But uh, well, where do you think like these powers that be want to take things this year? Um, well, does Jake want to say anything? Because um, I've sort of like been saying everything. So I've been replying to everything. So like, Jake, do you want to say anything? Uh, um, well, no, the whole point was just to, you know say you can all get involved and like find out if you have got local common purpose in your town or in your city you can you can still go up to them and talk to them and just find out what they're doing it's not you know as long as you're not too aggressive with them they're not gonna they see no reason why i can't talk to you about it so i think a bit of espionage a bit of like common sense will, will like make us a lot more um what? These aren't trained as tomorrow's leaders, so they're not scared to talk to people, are they? 
No, you know, that's our job. They have to come up with an answer. And sometimes if you catch them off guard, they give a stupid answer, which, you know, puts them in the thick of it. Well, this is it. And you can see the mantras that they, they chant over and over. Um, a friend of mine went to Occupy uh, from landofthefree.co.uk and he made a film on Saskia Ken and uh, she was down there manipulating the, the GAs. But there, there was one thing that they kept chanting over and over again, which was, this is what democracy looks like. Come and join us. And um, the last time I actually saw that was inside St. Paul's Cathedral, when they all chained themselves up inside St. Paul's on a, on a Sunday service night. So that was just the media attention, and I uh, worked that out. But when they're, they're chanting out, whilst chained up inside the church, this is what democracy looks like. Mm, really? Chained up inside a church, and I don't want a democracy, do I? And that's what they were calling for. Um, but even on that subject, in St. Paul's, you've got these protesters and all these big camera crews that were allowed to film. Um, I pulled out my little camera and I started filming and I had one of the workers from um, the church come over to me and say, oh, sorry, sir, you can't film in here. And I was like, um, OK, fair enough, why not? And he said, well... You have to have a license from the chapter house. And I was like, well, what about all of them over there? And he said, well, they've all got a license. And I was like, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because if you're going to go in there and on a certain day, loads of people have applied for licenses, the mainstream media and loads of other people to film this little event, that means, A, the mainstream media knew, B, Occupy knew and were hand in hand with the mainstream media, and C, the church knew. So it was all just a media stunt, and I, I call it a failed pussy riot because it, it was nothing more than a media stunt which failed epically. And one of the women that is, um, was chained up in there and doing most of the speaking is actually an actress called Alison Playford. So you've got actresses, you've got more within these movements. And I actually think... Um, my predictions for this year is protests are going to come back or are going to try and come back uh, very, very big with the likes of Anonymous, and um, which Anonymous is just one huge infiltrated um, psyop now. I know people that used to be part of Anonymous years ago and it was a hacking thing, but it's no more an intelligence gathering now. And people follow blindly by wearing these masks and having a bit of predictive programming by watching V for Vendetta over the years. And that's what they'll do. They'll go and follow blindly. They don't, you know what I mean? It's, you, you speak to these people on the protest and it's like, well, what are you doing here? Well, we're sick of the government doing that and doing this. And it's like, okay, so if you're sick of it, what do you expect to achieve from this? Because it's like, what protests have actually achieved anything? Like groups and especially groups that are set up by the government. They're only going to achieve what their goal is. I've, I've just had enough of it all, really. That I, I, I want to see positive change this year, somehow. I think we, we, I'm getting to the point now where you know, I think something's got to change some somehow, some way. I mean, if if the 2012, you know, my calendar thing is represents some kind of wake up inside us, then it's got to manifest itself soon. Um, this, I mean, what's going to happen this year is hard to say. I mean, I, I've not really thought much. I know there's probably going to be an escalation on behalf of the authorities in in bringing in more and more sort of like database issues, you know, more and more database um, sort of persecution. I, I've just found out there's been a big row over the, over the fact that Britain has been defaulting on its agreement to share um, DNA and fingerprint and other forensic uh, data data on suspects and people who've been arrested with um, the Interpol and other European countries and, and police forces in other European countries so there may well be some sort of event that may sort of like bring that to the fore and maybe get bring Britain into line, it could be something connected with the immigration hysteria or something like that, you know, but there's recently been a story about oh, there's all so many immigrants that can't be found, the population of Iceland is wandering in the country and no one knows where they are and everyone's sort of, I mean there were comments under the news article when I saw that which was saying, bring in more and more controls over people, 
that people have to show identity when they get jobs and things like that. And I thought to myself, you fool. When I read that, you fool. It's a, it's some, so a somebody's, song. somebody's getting a hump in the chat room saying we've made this possible for you. Uh, and you accused us of being infiltrated. What did you create anonymous? Did you, it was your idea, was it? No, I don't think it was. So like, unless it was great, prove it. But, if you're telling me that a movement of that sort of a size isn't infiltrated, then you've got to be backwards because movements get infiltrated if they're not orchestrated from the start. Quite that simple. The government do not want to be overthrown in any way. And if you, if you think that the anonymous movement isn't infiltrated, then um, where's all the money for the mask going? Dom, you know, um, you said something interesting earlier about the, the people who were chained up in St. Paul's Cathedral. Yeah. You know, it was, it was basically, it was an image, it was a media image that was created deliberately, it was staged. Uh, and is that what you were saying? Because one of them yeah. was an actress. Once an now actress, it's, they, they needed a licence to have the cameras in there. So this takes time and planning yeah. with the church, with the media and with Occupy. Because I found out a little, I found out a, a short a while ago, so, the, the, you know, you know, the common purpose have been releasing these sort of like promotional videos, and I, I've seen them. They're sort of like very, they're very well made. And I found out they were directed by Ridley Scott, the guy who directed um, Blade Runner and Alien and um, various other films like that. And I thought to myself, what, what films were he, made by Ridley Scott? Common purpose um, ones. Yeah, he made common purpose promotional videos. Oh, okay. Isn't that strange? Because he's a, he's a guy who probably doesn't get out of bed for less than fifty grand. He's a top Hollywood director. He made films like, yeah, Blade Runner, um, Alien, Gladiator, and um, several other movies he's made. Now, funny thing is, you were saying that um, was it? Yeah, you were saying that they they deliberately painted the people at Dale. They they sort of painted an image of the people at Dale Farm as being dirty. That, that, that was like media propaganda sort of sides of yeah. things, yeah. Because Ridley Scott is quite good at doing this, because in the film Gladiator, I mean, I, I did enjoy the film Gladiator, but it's, it's, in theme it's very pro-establishment, because the Romans are these kind of like heroic type individuals. The Roman Empire is sort of like seen as something lovely, and all, all the heroes are Romans, and the and, and the beginning of the, there's a battle scene at the beginning. They're fighting these these German barbarians, and they're sort of they're like that. They're all covered in sort of like blood and mud, and they're really filthy looking. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think that's it. Maybe I wonder if you know it's it's. I wonder if there's a connection there, because Rid, we really Scott is. Um, I don't, don't know much about him except he makes these movies. These he's very they're very good movies. They tend to be even neutral or very pro establishment. Um. Well, I mean, the connection between Ridley Scott and um, Dale Farm. Well, possibly not as an individual, but as part of the, the skills that he, his skills that he uses, his filmmaking skills, mm. might have been used in creating these images, both the one in St. Paul's and the one at Dale Farm. What, not do you mean the image that was on the front page of that woman holding the cross with the flames in the background? You know, the one, the one where there's people chained up in St. Paul's and the, the one in... And, and in Dale Farm, yeah, where they were, they were portrayed as very, very dirty, dishevelled kind of down and out people, deliberately well, as propaganda. I don't know if it was Ridley Scott or not, but like these will be all created by the uh, higher ech- echelons of the media, and they know exactly what they're doing. They've been doing it for decades to manipulate people and control. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't suggest that Ridley Scott was directly involved, but if they got, if they get someone of his caliber involved in making common purpose promotional videos. Yeah, what what's this? It's not it's not like they're skimping and sca- saving, you know. They're yeah. not they're not they're not sort of like cutting any corners or wasting wasting any kind of. They're they you know it's obviously not a, a budget. It's not a bargain basement budget that they've got when it comes to propaganda. Yeah, well, yeah. There's got to be um, a budget or or whatever for them to be dealing with this sort of stuff, and it does make you wonder how many people are involved in. Um, corrupting people whether they're in truth movements or or whatever you'll, you'll get people in there uh, um, paid from many different bodies when, when people say oh well can't find that they're police well have a look at their whole background and they might be connected to uh, 
A to Tavistock, B Common Purpose, BBC. Um, they might have a connection anywhere down the line. I'll have a look into it because, like I also said on my last show, um, woman that put up my bail address, she didn't even know me. She put up a bail address. Um, next thing I know, I'm in her bed, and then I'll, I'll find out that she's trained by the Tavistock Clinic. She's also got an ex-partner who's second command of GCHQ, Counterterrorism Spy Branch. Uh, she's got a lover, a whole load of lists, which makes her, to me, seem a little bit suspect of why you're in my life. And a load of things went wrong, manipulation and everything. And even this, this super patrol that I picked up along the way who tried to cause me ag for the past year. Mm. And he'd done a good job. He'd done a good number. But at the end of the day, he's an epic failure because he went over to a another radio station which i used to support for years and this is the reason that i've come over to this one because i will no longer support a radio station that um disregards hosts um whenever we have done a lot of hard work for them and i've seen it done to a few people and i've just had enough of like their sort of crap brew to be honest and the guys that have i, I didn't know any of these guys I've never spoke to them before i don't think uh, from this station but they all seem like really sound chaps and doing good things. At the end of the day, as there's probably one or two people within our group that are very questionable. But I, I just don't understand how somebody could be part of something, um, i.e. truth and the rest of it, and um, they've got a suspect past, i.e. they could be a PCSO, and they could have got the sack... Um, for racist comments or things like that, or even just got the sack. And then they join him instantly on to host a radio show. It's like, well, wouldn't you say, yeah, I used to be a, uh, an ex-PCSO or an ex-cop or something like that, uh, and tell people what you're doing? Because if you're going into a truth movement, like people have tried to expose me as an undercover cop, and it's like, well, please show me the proof, because I would, I would love to be proved that... Uh, I'm not a cop. Uh, I am a cop because I can stop doing this because I don't benefit uh, in a monetary way out of this. So, I, don't, you know, I mean, I'm only doing this for honest reasons and um, I, I get attacked many, many times just for being truthful. You know what I mean? I've been a bugger in the past. I've been, uh, I, I grew up uh, um, a little bit of a white boy. Um, then I tried to go out and get a job and, Always in debt and nothing ever suited me. And I just seem to like not be making any effects in the world or doing anything that seemed right from the heart. But when I started doing what I'm doing now, like full time, it seems honourable to do this. And it's my honest intention to make some sort of a change in the world. And as I've seen personally with myself, the way that the police, all right, yeah, I might get wrestled to the ground, but they come back up to six months later. And they talk to me, and they say, I've looked up this stuff. And whether they, they, they say, well, I can't comment while I'm in a uniform, but that, you know they're getting it. Police are waking up on mass, and this is what I've wanted to do personally. Because, yes, the legal system is an us, and it does enslave us by a body of words. We are policed by consent, but it's covert consent, and it's corrupted, and people do not know how they've been corrupted. So... I thought, right, I've got to get out there and try and teach the police um, how this system is to make them wake up because they're the ones that have lost their power. They cannot go out now and go, OK, look, um, I think that that banker is uh, an absolute criminal. They'd have to go and ask their boss and their boss will have to ask their boss and so on and so on and so on until somewhere down the line someone will go, well, we'll keep an eye on it. You carry on, go out to the street and do your parking tickets or whatever. Um, an ordinary cop feels like he hasn't got any power anymore. But the day that a copper does stand up and goes arresting people like Tony Blair for war crimes, and then that will be unstoppable in the media. A copper will go, OK, you're next, Tony Blair. He would get, he'd probably get shot. But like, at least he will be remembered forever and the world will change in that instant. But until then, it's going to take people to stand up and wake other people up, whatever it will be. And the hardest is to try and wake your family up, as many people are probably aware. When you try and wake your family up and um, to this sort of information, they're the last ones to want, want to know. 
And that's why it feels like sometimes you go out and you're preaching to the converted because all the groups that you, you may join on social networking sites such as Facebook and things like that, all the people in that group are all people that have been looking at this information. So you're not getting the information any further than the people that already know it. So what I've been doing is hitting police forums on Facebook and hit them with uh, meet your straw man or, or, or even go in the McDonald's Facebook group, which has got 26 million people, and just post up a link in capital letters saying how to get a free Big Mac and drop them a link of some interesting <laughs> conspiracy stuff. And then ones that do open it up looking for a burger might stay on it for a minute or two and get some information. Or I'll go on the EastEnders page, which has got millions again. And on their threads, they've got hundreds of people commenting every hour. So you drop a comment in there, instantly hundreds of people see it. And I would, I would write unseen, uh, unedited EastEnders footage. Who gets arrested? Question mark. And then like put up a YouTube clip, and it will have a plate, copper, uh, picture of copper there. So people will click it open and look at it, and it, it shocks people. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm just there to try and get information out. And um, just, just think, if only, if only one, it's only just one percent of twenty of twenty six million people. Just just look at it. I mean, think how many thousands that is. That's like, I can't work it out, but it's hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. yeah. And um, once what 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 actually happens, the way things work, I mean, this was worked out a long time ago by Lyle Watson, who was a really clever scientist, a very, very alternative, very, very uh, sort of like open-minded in his views. He works out that once, when it comes to spreading knowledge, you it's, it's not sort of like a, a continuous rise in knowledge where the, the knowledge is handed out by word of mouth continuously. Once it reaches a critical mass, a certain number of people within a certain population have a certain amount of knowledge, it almost instantaneously explodes into the rest of the group. So you don't have to wait. You don't have to sort of reach everybody. You have to just reach that critical mass moment. And so I always say to people, just keep trying, keep going for it. Even if it looks things look bad, just keep going forward regardless. Because it would be an absolute nightmare. And it would be it would be horrible if we quit the very moment before we hit that 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 point, that critical mass. So I say, just keep going forward, and eventually you'll get there. Oh, sorry, we might got stuck then. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you because all, all the times that I've I've had attacks and tried to be stopped and slander and insults, trolls, I'm still going to carry on because it's the only thing I know. It's carrying on speaking my truth and putting the word out there. No, well, you're doing a good job, Dom. Well done. I mean, that, that conversation with the policeman, uh, Rocco, you know, is absolutely remarkable when you consider the last time you met. It's really, it's really well, amazing. I'm actually considering putting up a video that I've, I've not put up. Um, and I, I've done it out of some stupid respect for the woman copper involved, but I don't even talk to her anymore. So... And the video is um, actually her saying stuff that confirms what we all know, that we are policed by consent. So if I don't consent, then how can you um, enforce that statute or act upon me? And she mm-hmm. goes, I'm well aware of that. And when I explain to her, um, being the City of London and you're working for the Crown, um, what, what the City of London is, which is half a square mile, which has all the banks located in it, then who do you work for? And she says the love banks. So I don't think I'm yeah. happy because that is going to be a shocker. But I, well, I, I hope you do, mate. I, I, I did do, because that'd be interesting. I did take it down out of respect for her because, uh, you know, I mean, I don't, she is a good copper and um, I, I, I wouldn't want um, the good cops to quit. That's the last thing I want because if you get all the good cops to quit their job, what are you left with? Hmm. I mean, would you be able to disguise her identity, you know, black out her face? Um, well, she would, well, no, because this is Bishopsgate Police Station in London. They, they all know me in there. They all watch my videos. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've got confirmation from this from many police on the street saying, yeah, uh, we, we actually watch your videos in the office with our bosses. So it's like, okay, cheers for that. And um, she's also said... Uh, because there is another video of her on my YouTube channel, it wouldn't be hard to um, find out that it's her. And yeah. they've, they've already seen it, 
because I put it mm. up instantly. Um, I sent her a message because I took her phone number from Occupy, and I sent her a message saying, um, yeah, I'll put that video up. And she said, yeah, I know, and uh, not happy because my face isn't blurred out. And um, then I tried blurring it out, and she still weren't happy, so I took it down. But that, might, that video might actually indeed come up over the, the next few days on my YouTube channel. Right. Well, I hope. I mean, obviously, if she's a good, she's a good copper. Then I hope no harm comes to her. Well, uh, one copper that's been on my channel, um, I think he's got an early retirement, and he was one one that started looking this information up and coming back to me with information. He was. Um, I went into the police station a few years ago, and I started asking him about the Cessica Trust Act of sixteen sixty six, and uh, he'd never heard of it. And we asked him a few things about consent, and if we're policed by consent, what does that mean? And he said to me, well, as you know, as we're in common law jurisdiction, that means no harm, loss, fraud, or breach of the peace. And statutes and acts actually require your consent to be given the force of law. I thought, this cop's brilliant. And then he went off, uh, came back. Well, we, we told him he was going to come back in a month. And I left him for at least a year. I can't remember how long. And um, went back in there, and he'd done a lot of research on the straw man and, and all these theories and everything out there. And he said, well, I've looked into it, but it would be interesting to see how that would go on in court. And uh, I think he has seen how it goes on in court now. But he's got an early retirement. And is that through um, his damn good, jolly hard work, or is it for asking too many questions? Well, I suppose like, like Charlie, Shel- Charlie Skelton. Was it Charlie Shelton? The guy, the guy from Skelton, yeah. I mean, once once that point, once a certain point is reached, those people will be, you know, you can't just, you can't enforce, you can't enforce will on people if enough of those people are standing up to you. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So hopefully we, we've reached a point now where people will be able to speak out and they will be able to speak say what they're thinking about these subjects without being persecuted because it's just no longer possible to anymore i mean i do feel hopeful when i look at the way propaganda today is so sophisticated compared to what it used to be you know you don't get these simplistic sort of like posters where they say your country needs you you know they have to you know we're nearly i think we're nearly at the end yeah and then it's much more sophisticated nowadays that gives me hope because they have to jump through more hoops to persuade us yeah well, all I say to people out there as it is coming to the end of the show is um, don't ever let anything get you down. Fear is an illusion in itself. So just carry on doing what you're doing. Be yourself. Uh, and um, <laughs> I've just been told to run over you like that or run over what. Um, yeah, just be yourself because nobody can stop you being you. That's the only thing they can't stop you doing is... Um, being real well mm. I'll tell you what they're, they're, they're saying run over if you like um, so after a couple of tunes might might actually come back on with what Bob do you want to come on and uh, what we'll do is we'll play a couple of tunes and we'll see how it goes we might actually come back mm. after the tunes ok well, I'm going to have to head off but um... so it's been brilliant having you Ben and uh, oh, Jake thanks Oh, thanks, Dom. It's been great yeah. being on the show. No, it's been brilliant. Yeah, nice talking to you both. All right. Cool. All right. Cool. All right. And um, for, yeah, I'm going to say thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, uh, sorry if I've burst anyone's bubbles, uh, especially the guy that's following Anon. Um, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't mean to burst it. Well, I do mean to burst people's bowls, I suppose. I'm just being me. It's, uh, I do provoke situations and make people think. I think people should be thinking more, uh, especially about following stuff that they haven't created themselves. Um, but anyway, let's, let's not come tune or, or do tunes and then see if I'm back after the break. Might not be, never know. But love you all. Thank you again. Cheers, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye. Room in my belly Grow from start Begin with the basics until you find a spark And it's on with the colour Cover every part If you need a preview, check my Technicolor heart While I guess we found Who we sold our Open game And our love's in peace Let's start.
the rule of quality, the vine shade. Some say closest to Hades, some say closest to making babies. That's one level up, yo, I'll touch on that later. Strawberry to cherry, root of the spectrum, blends to the cube of Satsuma segments. Carrot and goldfish, sacral emotion, mellow to custard, the buttercup potion. Stand powerfully centered, butter it equal, lemony snippets, submarine of the beetles. Breathe from the solar plexus, manicura, pro to a grass blade, side mana pura, unconditional love, closest to source, yeah. deep down emerald, summer golf course, wind chilled cheekbones of the old Norse, the colour of Floyd and Barbie's rose quartz. <laughs> Transition tanks fly like bunting, seeing through Anya, tunnel through time. Amethyst bless my bro, sapphire alike, healing flame in the mind. Cleanse my third eye, pituitary flies, pineal pilot, landing, laughing the land. In silence, sanguine iris, the reign of a prince, star blown apart. The ultimate end of Miss Beauregard, the end of the spectrum is only 3D. Imagine new colors, new frequency. just needs to change the name they're running all sorts of courses but you could call it the happy people course or something you know and have no relation to common purpose but it's still oh, a- li- common purpose they're just at the um they're the pinnacle of the conspiracy circuit because of people like um brian gerrish but I'm, i know for a fact that there are hundreds of these in the same format the same as common purpose yeah and um I've got information on one at the moment, which I'm going to look into a little bit more, and then mm. I'm going to fire it out. But it's like these these are not unique one little companies. There's many, many of them. And Common Purpose is, um, let, let's take something like Area 51. When Area 51, all the knowledge and that come out, and it was all in the mainstream and everything, do you think much activity would be going on there? Not really, because they've already got all their, their trained people, and they'll take them off to another department, and call it whatever you like, Area 52, if you want. But 
it's it's the same sort of format. Once you get exposed, they'll just go off and do it again under another guise. Yeah, they did that anyway, didn't they? They actually mo- did move everything from Area 51 when the actual government actually did officially admit there was an Area 51. Fi- Although everybody knew it was there, it had to be officially um, admitted. So, yeah, you did, right? I, re- I remember it. You brought some up earlier, and, and, you know, with Dave saying he was on the banana boats and stuff. Um, the Banana um, the, Republic. <laughs> the bean field. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned about the bean field. I was there on the last Stonehenge Festival, Dom, yeah. bef- before it was it. Uh, I know John Armitage very well. He was the trampoline man, the guy who uh, you could go and take LSD and jump up and down on trampolines. Uh, right. he, he, he now runs the, the, the Shambhala Foundation um, we were speaking of before, man. So the synchronicities are, are, are just ridiculous at the moment. So were you around in that time? Um, of uh, pre-Beanfield, Dave, w- would you? Um, no, I was, um, I mean, I've been up here in Scotland, sat about it. Uh, Brian Garish, I, I met him down in uh, Kirkcaldy. Me and a guy went down to Kir- uh, Kirkcaldy and Brian Garish did a talk there. And there was you would have remembered the miners' strike, though, wouldn't you? Yes. Uh, and the SPG, right. Um, the miners were broke in um, 1982, if I've got my dates right. Um, 1983, um, was, she was still dealing with the miners, uh, with the, you know, with the demonstrations and stuff. Margaret Thatcher. Um, the only people left after she, she took the miners out in, in in 1983. The only real movement there was within was what was known as the the English uh, or the, the the British. Excuse me, they might not have been clued up as we are now, um, but the British peace movement. That's what they were known as, the peace convoy all around the world. Um, uh, yeah, which yeah. was portrayed by the English media as the hippie convoy. And these people were moving around, making festivals free, um, the, the, um, which were normally on the old commons. Um, so they were the last people, really, uh, in Britain who were, were, were actually threatening this social state we see now before us. We're actually living. So, yeah, the Margaret Thatcher had to, they were the last one. She had the SPG already set up, and they were what we used um, on, to assault those people on the bean field. Not all of them were actually got there. They were, the, the, the people were on the way. You know, the, a lot of the vehicles moved on, of course, the main bulk of the convoy, but some had been broken up. Um, and uh, their, their story's quite amazing. They, they actually went off and they pinched a cow. And they lived on it. They lived on it, hiding out. Um, they are living it, yeah. So, see, it, it's see, people, people come up here to Scotland. They think it's free, you know, and you can walk in, and there's so much land there, but it's not. I mean, every the locals here, you know what they're like. They know every movement. You know, I was down in the west end of York when I was rich a few years ago, and uh, every local knew every person, and they know who's bringing in the drugs up here. But what was I going to say? You know, I don't know if you've heard about Findhorn, which is along the coast. That oh, there. yes. Yes, yes, right. I have. Now, Findhorn is just uh, not new world order. It's the United Nations. And they were all ageing hippies like myself. Well, it wasn't but, when it started, was it? It, no, was one, no. it was one guy, and it was a brilliant idea. The early uh, Inhorn, is that right? I call it Heinhorn, excuse me. I'm sure you're pronouncing it correctly. Right. Um, it was a brilliant idea. The man wrote some really good stuff. Uh, I've used some of his, his techniques myself in the aquaponics we've done. And, um, you know, it, 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 the reclaiming of land and how he went about it. Of course, it was then hijacked, I, I feel, Dave, a little yes. bit later by people who, who wanted an alternative life but wanted to have Nike trainers and a 26-inch television. Absolutely, that's right. So I've gone along there and it's beautiful and I've built these beautiful houses, you know, and you'll not see many vegetables are there, although they've got a huge big shop with all the stones and crystals and food, organic food, and it's wonderful to go there. But they're, uh, you volunteer and you pay like a thousand pound a week to volunteer and you get training and all this. And But they're so involved with the um, uh, United Nations and oh, that's scary when I look at the stuff, you know. So uh, it's, it's like they've been taken over, you know. They're not aging hippies anymore. They're young z- zippy guys. But uh, yeah, it's it's just seeing everything and seeing it like you're going. To, I'm like up here and now. I'm just a wedding photographer and photographer, 
and, and I've taken photos of everything and gone everywhere in the Highlands and all the weddings I've been in, all the castles, the best hotels, and I've been everywhere. But I'm looking at it with new eyes now, you know, I'm seeing signs. Um, you see signs <laughs> everywhere. I'm seeing signs from God. Well, maybe I am, yes. But uh, it's, 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 it's the quickening, brother. The quickening. Yeah, so it's it's really sore actually, you know, it's um, it's this powerfulness that you feel that I made a sign tonight. What I'm sitting doing is I'm making a lonely guy needs girl sign and there's a smiley face on it and my website address. And because I've been doing the videos and I'm a bit fed up shouting, I want I'm wanting stories about Highland Council, but I'm gonna go up there, I I'll have the sign and I'll give out my website address on uh, leaflets. And then just little leaflets. So I've got my website address, and then people will go on and say, "Oh my God, this guy's really nuts," you know, and uh, read about the Highland Council and so on. But after the Highland Council, I'm going after the European Union. You know, that's the. Uh, but they're a nasty bunch, the European Union. But um, the councillors here, you know, they're getting trips and all the rest of it, and getting uh, they, they spent 107 thousand pounds digging an archaeological hole here to discover if we had uh, in Dingwall if it was the Vikings were there and you should see the museum I've got photos on my uh, YouTube the windows have never been painted and the disrepair of the council it's the museum and they spend 107,000 in the big pothole when next to it there's potholes that would break your car yep so there you well, go. Maybe maybe you should get your council to have a word with the council here at Ashton Underline because they've created a hill um, through illegal tipping, uh, no tipping charges. So they've they've got quite a few pounds stashed away in somebody's back pocket somewhere. I fear, Dave. Um, so yeah, um, it's see I've said a few times. Although our little group here, um, and you know the land we took, mm. um, that. This is happening all over the place. They're using intellectual theft of land. Um, land can't be owned. You know, if you're born here, um, then, you know, it's yours. You know, or ours, I should say. Um, but from a personal perspective, you know, it's mine. This land where I'm on is mine. Well, I'm in occupation of my house. Um, yeah. that, that's it. I, I can't own it. What, what, what can, I can't sell it to you. How do I sell it to you? You're in Scotland. I'm down here. What good is it? Yeah. Well, and it, we've had this ideology now for, for thousands of years. Um, the Gray family was, was kicking around um, and, and using um, tanks, I suppose, of their day. Uh, a crusader and a, and, a, and a dozen or two dozen men. Um, and you either heeded to their, uh, to their rule... Um, or you were driven out of your homes. And then a few months later, they return, and the people who have heeded um, are then um, called heretics, of witches, um, and numerous other things, uh, and either murdered, burnt, or, or, or driven out of their homes. Well, um, wait, a minute, wait a minute. I'm Here's what you never hear now. When I was a communist, yeah, a agrarian reform. Now you never hear about agrarian and reform, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But I live in a council flat here. I went a bed set council flat, and I, we've got this. The the um, my land is uh, the four house flats have uh, this little communal garden, which three years ago I dug up and grew great, and then the next year it was crap. But up here, what we've got in land is the layers. Now, the lairds are on thousands and thousands of acres, you know, and they only got it because their their gang took the land over, say, Rob Roy McGregor, his uh, gang took that land over, and he, Rob Roy became the laird. Now, I'm going to become a laird. I'm going to become a lord because you, you can go to Highland, um, Highland Titles and you can buy a square foot of land over in the west, which gives you, entitles you to, to become a laird. And you can put this on your driving license if you've got one, and you can put it on your bank statement that you are the laird because you own land in Scotland. It costs 30 quid, right? So I'm going to become a laird, hopefully, but I've no money at the moment. I've not a penny, by the way. Uh, if, you, if any listeners would care to send in some money, that would be very useful, and I could buy some land and become a laird and laird it over you. 
But also, these, these lairds and they own the land up here, thousands and thousands of acres, and they, they put their um, stamp on it and don't let people on or don't let them camp there, you know. There's wild camping goes on, and the tourists love it up here, you know. And I don't want you all to come up here because it's so beautiful and free, and the roads, there's no police on the roads, and all the motorbikes come up here and do like 100 mile an hour on these. There's good roads up the west now. Uh, and the, the motorbikes come from all over Germany and everything because they love the roads, the freedom of the roads, the freedom up here, camp anywhere. And uh, so I don't want you to come. We're fully stocked. I'm sorry, we're closed. We're full up. Uh, but all the Polish are coming. Of course, Inverness is absolutely chock full of Polish. Well, I'm afraid the young guys, local guys, um, are not working. You know, just taking the drugs and whatnot. Dave, um, up in Scotland, you've also got no trespass law either, have you? That's right, it is different, yes. Um, yeah, you can go anywhere, yeah. And um, so how does that work on something like um, this term they call squatting? Ah, you can't you can't squat, no, you can't squat. Um, you can walk on the land, um, you know, provided it's not damaging the, uh, the cattle or something, you know. But no, yeah. No, I'd be squatting. So there's some lovely houses around here. I'd be squatting if you could, but you can't. No, I think. So it's what, what if um, what if a building's empty, um, totally empty and open? No, you can't squat in it. Um, I believe you can walk in the garden, sort of thing. I'm not too sure, but I'm pretty sure that's the, the case. You know, what, so what you if you built an earth ship or something like, or built um, with your own hands something on the land up there? What, no, do you know you, what would happen then? You, I know what you you end up in the jail right away because uh, that's the layered land, you know, uh, you know, yes. And the planning. I think we're back. I think we're back to ownership of land again, Dom. The layered yes. land. Whose land? Whose land? Hang on a minute. Who, whose land is it? Yeah, um, got, it's got. the land of every man, woman, and, and child who's born upon this land, isn't it? Under the Magna Carta. Uh, that, yeah. That's that's and and that was not upheld. That's our law. That's our law, not their law. Of course, you know, it, it reminds me of the man on the BBC coming on tomorrow morning and saying, right, rise up, everyone. The revolution started. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, land, the lead's not going to turn around and say, well, I do believe there might be one or two. Um, but, yeah, to actually get into that negotiation over paperwork for land, I, I'd be dubious there, Dave. Um, I, think, I think that's just the, uh, the Illuminati trying to trick with you, bro. Um, really is. Um, you don't. You don't. You don't want to be taking ownership of a land. You want to be declaring that land free. Yeah. You know. That's yeah. what we need to do, man. We need. And like I say, we need to take that back. I mean, it's the basis of what it is to be Scottish or or English or Irish or Welsh. You know, what have our ancestors stood here for so long for against this tyranny? You know, right. okay, we're more educated now than we ever were. We can now connect yeah. together across the world. We can we can put up internet radios in a couple of weeks. We we don't need to rely on them. We yeah. don't. And we've but, got them telling us they control this and they control that. Uh, but, no, no, more people like yourself and Dom, Dave, yeah, and we're, well, uh, we'll be there. Well, hold on a minute. Now, Hackling Council have got planning permissions. Yeah, you have to apply for planning permission. No, they're very, very, very strict up here, and they're, they're wrong, of course. And I know an architect, but you, I mean, if we have, uh, if we had people coming up here and just building them willy nilly, you know, so you have to have some sort of um, control. Oh, sorry to say that, but you do. No, you I know. get you. There's got to be some guidelines. We don't want every hippie turning up and suddenly camping out in the lads' backyard, and you know, be, you know that 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 it's no harm, no loss, no. <laughs> No deception, yeah. no breach of your peace, and that'd be breaching your the people of Scotland's peace. You know, it would yeah, be breaching yeah. your peace. You know, I, I, yeah. I ain't saying that. Uh, you see, what we did is we stopped waiting for the authority to give us authority to say it was all we right. Just go and do it. Uh, just that's go what we did. Do it. We just went and did it, uh, and then they denied that that they had any knowledge in it. Um, we give them prior notice of intention. Um, uh, we give them prior notice of intention. 
they denied all knowledge, they denied all knowledge to us, to the national papers, local papers, local radio, national radio, and eventually national television and the allotment association, even the association that should have actually acted years ago on, on behalf of the people of, of Ashton Underline. They chose not to. Um, but, of course, once the, the, the major media gets involved, they want to get involved um, for a £20 fee. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the top and bottom of it is it is now a common land. They're now trying to negotiate. You can't. Don't wait for them, bro. Don't wait for them to give you authority, you know. Get a pocket full of seeds, Dave, and go and start planting stuff in the back garden. And when you go around and start taking it up and they say you're damaging the land, you say, I'm not, I'm improving it. I planted these here and I've improved the land because now this land is, is, is creating, it's making something. And that something, maybe a potato or a few peas or an ear of corn, is now of a value. You can uh, eat it, it has now got value, uh, therefore you are increasing the value of the land, not decreasing the value of the land, uh, and if they have got a problem with you, then you could charge them for your work in increasing the land for them. We've got yeah. to play them at their silly game, you know, and it there's is a, a silly game. There's a guy, uh, there's a guy uh, near Glasgow now, I can't get onto TUPC and uh, FMOTL because of password, I don't know, but there's a guy, Stephen, near Glasgow, and he's... He claimed this land, which had been lying idle uh, near Glasgow. Is it Glasgow. Forvik? Uh, eh? Is it Forvik? No, no, I know, but Forvik, the island up, up and I haven't uh, looked at him for a while. This guy claimed the island up uh, in Shetland, because Shetland is not part of the United Kingdom. It's never ratified, and he's claimed the island, and I must have a look at his website. I've been talking to him, and he's got he's claimed the island and lives on it and all the rest of it. But he's not much of a so well. The thing is, he, didn't he get arrested a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago? Oh dear, yeah. He was yeah, making so stamps. He can sell stamp stamps and passports and all sorts. And all the uh, Africans were buying these passports. And but uh, I must find out about uh, Stephen near Glasgow, who's claimed this land and he's uh, doing organic on it and all the rest of it. But yeah, the, so so it can be done. But uh, Shetland's different, yeah, because it wasn't. It's never been uh, legally ratified that's part of the United Kingdom. And uh, don't talk to me about the, the Crown Estates. Now, I, I I got my pension and I bought a yacht and I sailed around the Western Islands for uh, five months. And uh, when I was anchoring everywhere, it was the Crown Estates on the seabed. Well, I says, wait a minute, they don't own the seabed. You know, I own the sea. God own, owns the seabed. And they're charging you for uh, mooring on the seabed. Bloody Crown Estates, but yeah, when the because it's only when the tide goes out, though, Dave. Um, the, the crown only owns the land when the tide's out, they don't own the water. So, they yeah, can only, sorry, if you're in a if you're in a permanent wet location, uh, non tidal, then they can't charge you from Crown yeah, Estates. Um, Been yeah. there, mate, done that one. Yeah. The, the, the own the uh, Crown Estate ones, I think it's 12 miles, or it might be more, you know, up here. Well, that's that, the worst, mate. Only hey. at the low water, only at the lowest point. As long as your vessel does not go on to dry, are you with me? When the tide goes out, they can't charge you. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'm sorry, up here. They, ne they never got a penny out of me. The, up here, it's the Crown Estates, and it's for 12 miles out from the land, at least 12 miles out, and they're charging for moorings there. Uh, and I was on, I've been on their case for when I was stopped by the police in Kellogg's in my boat and they were wanting my name and I wouldn't, I didn't speak to them then, I used to do not speak to police uh, and which I have up on my website when the police uh, stopped me in Inverness for filming there and I was chatting away like Mary, I didn't chat to them at first and they grabbed my arm and the first words I said, you, you assaulted me and then I went on to tell them uh, everything that I was doing, you know, because I want the police to know as Tom says they're our friends, they're protectors, that's their job. And I want them, because one crazy guy did uh, attack me when I was videoing in the street with a megaphone up in Inverness, and uh, he was just so angry at He had a, a yellow jacket on, and I think he was maybe a council employee, but he, was, he wanted to attack, he was burning with rage, and I was a bit worried. And I would have wanted the police to protect me then, but uh, I mean, everybody thought I was crazy, but he was really crazy, you know. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm getting known by the police, and it's a good thing. As I said earlier, I phoned the, when I was going to Edinburgh Garden with my megaphone and my camera um, on Friday. I uh, phoned up the police and said I'm coming up to preach the word of God, which I did do. I didn't use the megaphone. It was so good. Everybody was speaking and telling me stories about the council. So, um, yeah, the police are good guys. Well, they should be. But I've been in, I was a prison officer for two years, as Dom will know, I put on my website because I don't want anybody to say, oh, he worked for the Crown, you know, and I was two years in Perth prison. I love saying that to people. I did two years in Perth prison and they said, oh, what for? I said, well, um, I was an officer, actually. It was after I came from a merchant navy, you know, you need no job. Oh, here's my phone. Somebody loves me. I'll mute the mic. Do you, want to, uh, do you want to add anything there, Don? We've got about five minutes. Um, well, I was just listening to the conversation about um, the, the water and um, the, the debate back and forth. And I wondered, like, because I know people that travel up and down um, rivers and, and they don't pay for moorings and things like that. But if they get caught, they have to move along to the next spot. Yeah, it's five, uh, it's, it's five nautical miles um, or or um, five locks, uh, a lock is classed as a nautical mile. Okay, and what, what's that, um, from the borders of England or, or the UK? No, no, you, that's what you have to move. Oh, is it? Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so it's, like, it's, it's, you can only stay, I think, for two days or four days. I'm not sure on the amount of days you can stay, and then you have to move. We have a series of four locks here, um, and, and boats move up the four locks, and then half a mile and stay there and then move back down again the four yeah. locks and stay there and that's how they avoid it <clears throat> but the crown charges is normally on tidal estuaries and um, where you've got boats moored normally seagoing boats um and you have to play a, a, a charge it's, it's not a lot um but per year but that it can only be charged on uh, if you, you you your boat basically um, goes aground most moorings on the tide when the tide um, goes in and out. Yeah, that's right. Your boats float, and then they, then they, then they're on the actual land. And when they're really? on the land, then you've got to pay the crime charge. But if if you're in a um a um a, a one what what is not affected by well it will be affected by the tide in this little island we're on. But yeah, like I say, if if you're in um um oh what do they call it? you're not in a tidal um uh, estuary or you're not in a tidal dock. Uh, one that's open all the time, regarding the, and your boat doesn't go on the ground, yeah, then they can't charge you. Yeah. Uh, now, well, there may be charges for for the key to tie up on, on the lock side or something like that, and that often goes to the upkeep um, of, you know, the, 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 the people mooring on, on the key side, um, actually on the dock. But to moor off that... Um, yeah, um, you, you, you're all right, um, especially if you're dropping your own mooring. Now, if there isn't already a mooring there, then you can't go and tie up to it. That is actually classed as somebody else's property. If it's, you know, if there's a boy on a mooring, um, most places have a visitor's mooring where you can go in for the night um, or, or a day or two. So, yeah. I have, I've been looking at, and this is for some years, I've been looking at this boat and... Um, it's like a giant greenhouse, and I've been thinking if I had the right people, I'd go and take that, take it 13 miles out, and be a pirate and start travelling around the coast of the UK with a radio station, belting out to the borders, and uh, see how well that bit of action goes. But yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, wait, wait till you come and see us. <laughs> not saying too much. Well, well wait till you, you're going to get down here, Don. We're we'll, 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 we'll getting there. Um, Definitely coming Saturday, yeah. Yeah, we're getting there. Um, we have got radio equipment um, already. Um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> and we've got a boat. Um, I wouldn't like to go 12 miles out in it. Um, but, yeah, the ideology, man, of having um, what we we thought of was um, um, not just a, a boat, but also um, uh, a vehicle uh, and connect them to the satellite network. Um, so we could have live streams and send them wherever we want, whether it be by land or by sea. Um, we kind of scaled that down a little bit to inland waterway, because um, there is quite a big movement, um, especially in Ireland. Um, and it's not, um, 
it's not too difficult to put two narrow bolts together uh, and get even across to uh, to France uh, if you buddy up. Um, so yeah, it's it's some other um, we've already looked at. We've already looked at. Uh, cool. Do you, are you guys familiar with Radio Caroline, which we, I think Jimmy Savile was on? You know, there was these uh, radio three ships, Radio Caroline, years ago. And then there was all sorts of laws brought in, and that's when the Radio 1 started, that the laws were brought in about uh, pirate radio stations. Yes, I, I do remember it. Um, uh, I've also, <laughs> there's also a movie out there, um, quite a funny film, called The Boat. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, and, and that is the portrayal of, of Radio Caroline. Really funny. Um, yeah. Really funny film. Uh, my favourite bit is the guy called, I think he's called Bob as well, uh, and, and they go, who are you? And he went, I'm Bob, I do the midnight hours. Um, <laughs> they'd never seen him. <laughs> he'd been on the boat for six months, they'd never seen the guy. So it's a good movie, it really is. It is, yeah. It, it is. really is a good film. And, and you know, uh, I don't know how long we'll get away with doing what we're actually doing, uh, providing a, a platform, really. Um, and it says it, a platform for the free men and women. And that platform, I hope we've proven somewhat um, with Dave tonight. Um, me and Dave had never spoken before this evening. Literally, it, it, Dom, it, he's seen Dom, and Dom's connect, we've connected up, we've got on, he's saying his stuff on the radio. And he'll be back on more, I hope, Dave. Could, um, could I just say my website is muirmatters.co.uk, that's M-U-I-R-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.co.uk, Muir Matters. And my YouTube channel is a, a Highland Council at War or Muir of Ord 1, which is M-U-I-R-O-F-O-R-D, number one. I stay in Muir of Ord, which is near Inverness. Dave, Dave you, may, you may not have noticed this, but below this black box where we've, you've got all these little pictures with our names under, um, to the left of it, there's a little round blue bubble. If you click that, uh, a text box will open up, and you'll see in there that uh, Robo Hippie, I am Ty. Um, if you put your information in, we'll put all the links on the Dark City side for you, mate. No, no worries at all. So we'll get you on there, mate, uh, and then people can uh, can just follow the links and get them. It's a bit difficult sometimes for people to get down the websites. Um, you know, uh, we live in a world where the pen and pencil is not freely available. <laughs> <laughs> okay folks we're a little bit over the time um junior dj junior show starting um so we'll uh, we'll drop um we'll drop the auto server uh, enjoy the show and we're uh, well we're, you'll have to watch the schedule um it really is that schedule is 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 really it's jumping about like um well dare i say like a, a jew on his wedding night so uh yeah, thanks for joining us. If you are out there, it's Dark City Radio. We had Dave from the Highlands, Highland Dave, out there getting his stuff done. We've got Robo Whippy and uh, our beloved, our beloved, commonly known as Dom. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. See you later, folks.